Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, order of business is closure of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof. Seeing none of the minutes from. Previous council meeting. <laughs> Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, move for the second for the minutes, please. Jones and, and Mark, so all in favor? City Warden McPhail. Yes. Councillor Purcell. Yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. Councillor Mark. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Yes. You muted too. Yes. If you want to see. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor French. Yes. Councillor Shiger. Yes. Councillor Ketchba. Yes. And Mr. Warden. Yes. Nine zero. The motion is carried. Thank you. Next, we have a presentation from Royal Oaks. Are they on the board? Yes, they are. Okay. Folks, you could carry on. Good morning. Can uh, everybody hear me properly? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so, dear and counselors, I do appreciate uh, uh, your time of uh, hearing us, uh, and it's a pleasure to present in this morning for you. Uh, although these uh, actually pandemic conditions are not very uh, uh, very generous with us, and sometimes we run into technical glitches. Um, I um, I will present today um, about our uh, Royal Oak Retirement Residence uh, transition that a project at uh, 39232 Finger Line uh, in the in the township of uh, of uh, South Oak. So let me introduce myself. Uh, uh, basically, I am the CEO of Diamond uh, Senior Residence, the owner of. Uh, am I still on? Hello. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I did have some difficulties with the sound and the the uh, the visual. So basically, I'm the owner of Royal Oak uh, Retirement Resident Project um, that including this transitional bed offering. Um, my name is Christina Bogza, and I have today with me uh, the CEO of Castellar Management uh, Services, which is uh, Jamie Lowry. Uh, just to uh, actually shortly introduce myself, I'm a professional engineer as a background. I worked construction for the last 35 years, and besides my work in construction, building, and uh, developing, I do have... Uh, uh, quite an important portfolio of holdings that are basically uh, either multi-residential, commercial, industrial, and um, this time around, I was uh, looking to uh, to actually get involved into senior living. Uh, for me, actually, it's more of a actually personal commitment than a construction project in itself. It's more than brick and blocks. Recently, um, I uh, lost both my um, dear um, seniors in my family, my mother and my uh, my husband. So uh, I'm coming with this project um, as a kind of a personal commitment, more than, as I said, bricks and blocks. Um, Jamie Lowry is uh, CEO of Castellar, as I mentioned, and uh, his company has a considerable experience uh, in managing operations uh, in the quantum of senior care, as that includes, I guess, retirement residences, long-term care for seniors, and um, uh, they will be our management company for Royal Oak. Uh, I know that there might be some time constraints, and uh, besides the awkwardness uh, of this uh, actually, uh, video conferencing, I will uh, try to uh, kind of present our property. Jamie, can you flip through the pages, please? Uh, basically, to introduce uh, everybody that's right. So, um, I'm not so sure if everybody is familiar with the property at King Line, but basically, uh, it is a project that encompasses uh, uh, 82,000 square feet uh, of in space ground floor. We have 103 units when built, and um, we are in the process of uh, actually developing the property on the inside. The shell, uh, the shell was actually left idle for a 
already um, this was not um, actually completed by previous owners. We engaged into purchasing this project, and uh, we have a very aggressive uh, schedule of completion for uh, November, late November 2020. Uh, when fully operational, we probably will employ to the extent of 30 local people, and um, it, uh, we did give you uh, a handout with some details on the building. Now, there is quite a substantial investment in, uh, in the township. Living experience that. Uh, Basically, uh, it relieves, uh, it relieves uh, the stress, uh, demands of maintaining their own uh, homes, and uh, we, uh, they would be probably encourage uh, to engage in activities and socialization at the time that that would be possible. Anything and services, um, and I guess I will uh, after this introduction I will let Jamie to basically forward on the presentation that we have and the proposal that we have to incorporate additional beds uh, through this uh, through this facility. Jamie, can you uh, actually carry forward? Please? Thank you, Christine. I'm just going to flip to the next slide. If I can here. Um, I guess from our uh, review that um, in the area there are, there are probably about uh, more than 25 percent people that are 60 to 80 years and you know from the healthcare perspective there really is a, a real um, a couple of different things going on obviously but an aging population um, the uh, buildings to keep up with uh, senior services um, and you know really look, working together but I think one of the things that's most interesting about this project and and looking for your support as far as transitional beds is that what we often see in in uh, in the care community is that people that uh, move to a a, um, a setting like this um, you know they're, they're you know often they're in decline they're waiting for a long-term care bed or or have been serviced by uh, home and community care we often see the people that move into a, a, a setting like this really improve the power of, of uh, social contact and programming and being around other people. It really does um, some miraculous things. So, from a from a healthcare perspective, it's much much more than than simply a, a bed and a table and those kinds of things. I think what what this project brings to the community is. First of all, an opportunity for, for people to um, really age with some uh, dignity and, and uh, improve the quality of life. Um, and then, you know, often they're, they're there, um, you know, the possibility of, of being there between, uh, from our uh, view, uh, one to three months, sometimes a little bit longer, and then, then they move to um, potentially to long-term care. So um, it really is hinging on uh, bringing people together um, we've reached out to other um, other groups in the community, including the um, the long-term care facility next door, uh, Elgin Manor, um, to see if we can work together and, and find ways to uh, to leverage the yeah, the two properties. But um, it really, is giving that care, which is um, you know the the, uh, the care model is, um, is is very different from long-term care. It's actually now it's. Um, from our perspective, is a minimum of a one to eight um, for care. We have a, an RN, um, we have all our OT, we have therapy rooms and all kinds of things. Um, and again, the, the goal here is to improve the quality and to, um, you know, and, and to help people um, recover. Um, again, what we see uh, in our holdings is that when they're in hospital for an extended period of time, and, and, it, and it just turns out that the beds that uh, Christina is developing the, for the transitional beds is, is about the um, same amount of uh, beds that are currently in the hospital and an ALC um, holding pattern and so it really is going to take a lot of pressure also off the hospital so it's a it's a uh, the southwest land is looking for all opportunities um, for these types of relationships to get people out of the hospital get them in a care setting and see them improve and it's also a, a, a bit of a stopgap while they're waiting for a long-term care bed. 
Um, you know, the, the uh, I think the beauty of the thing is, uh, as I mentioned, is the uh, the PSW uh, ratios. Um, I think the other thing is in, in this setting that uh, all the units are on the ground floor. Um, people have access to the outside, um, and uh, and we've learned a lot from this pandemic uh, when it comes to care models. And so, we're uh, Christina has adopted technology. Um, every room will have a TV for not just you know watching TV, and but it really is going to be a, a gateway to healthcare. Um, so virtual uh, doctor visits, and almost more importantly, uh, for seniors to have um, in-unit uh, visits with their families, um, other other you know, friends, and those kinds of things without leaving the um, the, the comfort of their unit. Um, the, the also the important thing is that, again lessons learned from the pandemic. Um, there are some technology that has been invested in this facility in order to ensure that um, um, people, visitors, and staff that are coming in or their um, that their temperature are checked and they're screened. The technologies that's in place um, is that uh, the temperature will be taken of staff. If they're an elevated temperature, an alarm will go off, and that person will be identified because it's a uh, recognition. Um, so there's, you know, will be, you know, a really, it's a, it's a firewall in, of, of sorts in, in order to protect the seniors. The layout of the building is such that if there is an outbreak in, in one particular wing, um, there's the ability to isolate um, that wing um, and and keep it, uh, you know, the rest of the residents um, um, safe. I really think um, the most the largest investment I think is the activity um, and the uh, the spaces that are available, both external, outdoor spaces, a very different uh, type of space, and internal um, with the you know its, it's own, um, which is a very big thing in all uh, in all uh, senior residents. Don't know why, but um, it's it's uh, it actually is uh, one of those things, but. Um, a very good, well laid out uh, from a safety perspective, from a technical perspective, and uh, a pandemic, um, a pandemic protection and insulation. You can see a couple of uh, examples of the rooms in the outdoor, um, uh, uh, dining rooms that always have access to the outside. Um, there's salon spaces. There are um, a variety of of, uh, of room layouts. Again, one of the things is that uh, kitchenettes and uh, and and uh, fully accessible washrooms. So if you do need a little bit extra help, uh, the room is there for you to uh, to receive that help from the staff at the at the at the home. So, Christine, did you want to take over the uh, the transitional care or, or the beds? And we'll... no, I guess you can carry forward, Jamie, if you don't mind. Yeah, I guess really to, to recap is that um, you know the uh, the ministry and and um, folks at the land are looking for uh, to ensure that there is uh, there's consultation with the uh, with the community, um, and this is one of those one of those venues, and so we're looking for that support to um, it doesn't it doesn't cost the uh, the organization uh, being Elgin County any money. Um, it, all the health care is paid for by the by the ministry. Uh, there, there is likely to be a co-payment, but the co-payment will be geared basically on the same terms as uh, long-term care. So it's uh, it really is um, it really is geared to income. So we're not shutting people out, and it gives just that other option for seniors um, that are in crisis, um, uh, some more uh, breathing space, and it also gives the um, the ho local hospital some breathing space because again, um, with COVID, as many of you may know. Um, the hospitals now have uh, a cap on the uh, on their uh, occupancy. Many hospitals make, it was quite common for them to be operating at 110 percent capacity, and you'll see that you know, way medicine. Um, because of that, um, the the ministry has now uh, capped them. They cannot, um, you know, you know, they always have to have capacity uh, in case there's a second wave or another pandemic. So. That has reduced the amount of beds that are available um, to them for ALC. So, options are absolutely necessary um, for uh, for seniors in the community. So, uh, so the 
basically, uh, we, uh, we saw the gap uh, in the quantum care, and uh, basically I am having an offering for 20 of uh, ALC beds that will serve the community, and I hope that uh, uh, our offering will be uh, as well received as uh, everybody that we actually got in contact with. I am here to assist from, as I said, a more of a personal perspective, I've seen the need and I am trying to act upon. Um, by um, September, this facility uh, basically will be open for uh, walkthroughs and um, um, there will be a sense of what's the availability in, uh, in here. I encourage you, if you are interested to see the facility, to actually come over and visit us. Um, and in essence, we are looking for your support that uh, uh, will uh, kind of enable us to provide this, uh, this support for the Ministry of Health and um, for, in essence, for the seniors of your community. Um, that probably concludes our presentation. If you do have uh, questions, I uh, guess me and uh, Jay. Jamie, I'm sorry, me and Jamie, we are going to actually answer to them, are more than glad to answer them. Any questions that we can be of assistance with? Okay, thank you, Christina and Jamie, for that presentation. Certainly, Elgin County is very pleased to see this building that's been sat final for a number of years coming into use. Um, one of my questions for you is, We've had numerous conversations around this table in the last year about hospice, and the you know, St. Joseph is looking for eight to ten beds in Elgin County. Is that something that you have discussed with St. Joseph's by any chance, Jamie? Um, not at that, not at this point. But um, from a from a uh, facility perspective and a care facility uh, perspective, I think that um, certainly the option. Um, for some type of hospice, um, as well, again, it's uh, it's something that I would discuss with uh, Christina. But it's uh, I know that uh, in every community, uh, hospice space is super important, and, and uh, it is worthy of consideration for sure. But to this point, um, we haven't had that conversation with. Okay, I, I hope you follow up because the province has got 1.6 million earmarked for this as well as there's some private donations that like would like to see this go forward. So I hope you follow up with that. We will definitely follow up. Any questions for either Christina or Jamie? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Any more questions that we can answer? Sally, go ahead. I don't have any questions. I just wanted to commend you on this. I'm really happy to see more senior care in our community, and they look like excellent units. I really do hope you uh, were. I'm happy to support uh, transitional beds, but I really do like the idea of hospice as well. And it would certainly be great if there could be certain beds set aside for hospice care. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Any other questions from Council? Go ahead, Grant. More of a comment. Uh, when we first heard of this presentation about a month ago, it's very exciting. I know uh, they've been working hard with our staff uh, through the building department, and uh, there's nothing bad been said about the, the company. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with them, supporting my staff, and uh, very pleased to have them in Southville. Thank you, Grant. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. We need a motion to receive a file. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you. And a, a motion, it, should council wish to direct you to send a letter in support of transitional beds to the Ministry of Health. Okay, so as Julie said, moved by Martin, second by Trail, all in favor. Board Ms. Nail. Yes. Purcell, Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councillor Martin? Yes. Councillor Marks? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor French? Yes. Councillor Jaguar? Yes. Councillor Ketchbuff? Yes. And Mr. Morton? Yes. 9-0, the motion is carried.
Thank you. Uh, next, we have a presentation by the Rainbow Optimists. Is Paula and Martin there? Paula. Paula, or... Good morning. Good morning, Paula. Can you see us okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I don't know if Martin's there or not yet. I haven't seen Martin, but you go ahead. Okay, I will start. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, Martin Withen shows with the Rainbow Optimist Club. I'm also a member of the Rainbow Optimist Club, but I'm also uh, the president of an organization called Am I Understanding? And my understanding is working in uh, southwestern Ontario now for about six years to start conversations with the community around uh, children's mental health. We do that three ways. We do it through uh, videos, we do it through community exhibits and one-on-one -on -one support. We work with some pretty strong partners as far as this is concerned. We're working with the Thames Valley District School Board to develop our resources, LHSC's Child Youth and Development Clinic, Vanier Children's Services, and most recently, the Child Youth and Development Clinic at Western University. So we really have a strong group of people around us. Uh, the big thing that makes us different is we are not a mental health organization. We're a community, we're a communication tool. And we realized a number of years ago when it came to children's mental health, focusing on children 12 and under, that although early intervention was so important for a lot of families, the stigma, the shame, and the lack of understanding when it came to those issues were keeping them from getting support. The other challenge was, of course, how do you start these conversations? My background is in television production. I worked with CHUM and CTV for years and had some very interesting friends uh, who used to work for Jim Henson. And we found that if we developed some high quality puppets with some high quality productions and worked with our community partners to really create some strong videos to start conversations, that we could make a difference. I don't know if you saw some of the resources that I sent forward, uh, but again, we've been working with the schools and the communities now to use these videos to start conversations around children's mental health. A couple of years ago, we realized that a couple, um, we had families coming forward to us saying these are good videos. Uh, do you have anything on acceptance and understanding? And do you, more importantly, do you have anything when it comes to gender identity? We have questions, but we don't know how to start the conversation. So we partnered with Pride London Festival and we developed a series called Pride Understanding. These videos are meant to start those early conversations, help families start conversations about transgender, about same-sex marriage, about gender identity with little ones. Uh, we again worked with our community partners, made sure that the communication was there and the messaging was clear, and we have really had a lot of success with that program. Again, the messaging when you're dealing with, with, with little ones, it's pretty straightforward. Acceptance and understanding is really important. Don't assume everybody is the same. Certainly don't judge anybody for being different, and questions are good if they're respectful. Uh, these videos have been used throughout Thames Valley District School Board as young as kindergarten to start conversations. We also find they're very effective with adults and with seniors. Uh, we do write our videos up so families can watch them together. But again, what they do is they create a safe environment for everybody to ask questions and increase their acceptance and understanding. What we want to do with this project is we want to continue our conversation around acceptance and understanding. Again, with that topic as well as children's mental health, we're a strong believer that starting those early conversations is important. We can't wait till these kids are 12 and 13 to start having conversations about people's differences. We feel that our the way method of doing it is certainly unique and open and accepting to everybody's point of view and that we do create safe environments for conversations. With this video that we're looking at is the project of the Safe and Vital Community Grant preventing hate crimes through community collaboration. So what we want to do with this is we want to reach out to community partners in Alden County, including at this point the police that we've already gotten a letter of uh, support from, the libraries, the YMCA, the groups that deal with the multicultural communities, and we want to... ...to create uh, a series of resources that help create those early conversations. 
support, support respectful curiosity. Uh, encourage youngsters to ask questions, to not assume that everybody who's different is going to be bad, but create those, uh, those skills that they're going to need early on to be open and understanding when they're older. We already have great partnerships with the schools. We already have people lined up to help us develop curriculum. We have our partners, like I said, at Vanier and Western to support us as well. But again, the idea is this two-year project will develop a series of resources that communities can use to start conversations at schools or in the home. And we're going to uh, support that with curriculum, programming, and uh, again, as community campaign to really get that messaging out there around acceptance and understanding. It really isn't a stretch from what we're doing now. Mental health, of course, is everywhere and a big part of our entire community. And we believe that, again, if we don't have acceptance and understanding, we are going to see an increase in, in mental health in the community. It is such an important topic now, and we have had families coming forward using our acceptance and understanding video that we did through Pride Understanding to start those early conversations. And we feel if we bring the community in Elgin County together, that we can create some fantastic resources that can not only be used here, but can used, be used across the country to start those conversations. That's us in a nutshell, and what we're looking from you guys this morning is a letter of support. Like I said, when we included the package, we did give you an example of some of the videos. I think we included this acceptance and understanding video, which is about five minutes long, and our latest video, which is how to be an ally. Again, the messaging, as much as it's for children, is also supportive of adults, and I've had a number of parents through it this uh, pandemic tell me that they use these resources on a regular basis to start conversation and remind themselves of how to act appropriately and be a big part of their community. So that's what we're looking from this morning. Are there any questions? Thank you, Paul, for your presentation and certainly acceptance and understanding is very important in Elgin County. And thank you for doing that. Uh, question for Paula. One other, thing I, I, one other thing I might add and where it's so timely with this project is with MI Understanding, our focus this year is the rural communities. We are working very closely with the university to really take our resources into the community and support the families there. So this would really marry nicely with this initiative. Okay, thank you, Paula. Seeing no questions, Julie, can you give us the, the resolution? Certainly, so uh, be it resolved that the report from Martin Withenshaw and Paula Detsey from the Rainbow Optimists be received and filed and that the warden be directed to provide a letter of support for the Rainbow Optimists application to the Safer and Vital Communities Grant Program. Okay, mover and seconder for that. Marks and Jones, all in favor? Deputy Warden McPhail? Yes. Councillor Purcell? Yes. Councillor Martin? Yes. Councillor Marks? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor French? Yes. Councillor Shagar? Yes. Councilor Ketchbaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. 9 0, the motion is carried. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and we'll continue to keep you posted on our initiative. Thank you, Paul. Cheers. Have we got Annie and Isaac on board? They haven't joined yet. They haven't joined. Okay. We'll come back to that. You let me know when they're back, and then we can. Jump back and forth. There we have them scheduled for 940, so okay. 10 minutes from now. Okay. Mover and seconder to move in the committee of the whole. Ketchabaw and Martin, all in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail? Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Martin? Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Jaguar? Yes. Councilor Ketchabaw? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. Zero, the motion is carried. Thank you. First on the agenda is the warden's activity report, and there is one change that uh, uh, we will eliminate. I had a meeting with the OPP, and that was as as a uh, mayor rather than the warden. So, other than that, um, I present the warden's activity report. Any questions, comments? Mover and second to receive and file. Jones, seconder. Martin, all in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail? Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Martin? Yes. Councilor Marks? 
Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Shiger? Yes. Councilor Ketchba? Yes. Councilor Warden? Yes. Right, the motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, next, we have um, Councilor French and Councilor Martin on the Community Safety and Wellbeing Coordinator Committee update. You want to lead that off, Sally? Certainly. Um, it, it's. I think it's important. This is we're moving ahead as best we can in the middle of a pandemic. Um, Jennifer has been doing a great job, and and we've been doing a lot of it online. But we've identified a lot of groups that need to be part of this, and they've been they're part of this community advisory committee. We have two committees, and it's a bit confusing. We're the coordinating committee, but these others are the advisory committee, and. Um, so it, it's important that you realize these things are moving forward, trying to work out a way to get these surveys to everybody, um, because not everyone is technically savvy or online or whatever, but we're doing our very best in this time. And, and uh, Mary and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay. Mary, have you anything else to add to that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I, I just wanted to bring to the council's attention that the information that we have compiled so far from Jennifer's hard work, she's really been helping us out. It's an eye opener. Um, a lot of the information that she supplied is statistics from our um, individual municipalities. And uh, you're gonna be surprised with the numbers and the statistics. I certainly was. So uh, when all this information comes together, I'm pretty sure that everyone's uh, going to appreciate all the hard work of this committee. And Jennifer's doing an amazing job. So just encourage everyone on your council to complete the survey. And of course, any residents, we, we need as many people as possible to respond to the survey. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mary. Any questions for either Mary or Sally? We need a motion to receive and file. Mover and seconder, Marks, Martin. All in favor. Deputy Warren McKay. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councilor Martin. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Jaguar. Yes. Councilor Ketchba. Yes. The Warden. Yes. Nine zero. The motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, Bob, you want to give us an update on the Terrace Lodge redevelopment? Yes, sir. I'd be happy to. Um, we did send out quite a comprehensive report for everybody on County Council, and I'm sure you've had a chance to look through it. So I'm just going to hit some highlights, and then we have a very important discussion to have uh, before uh, we get our final decision on how you want the committee to move forward. Um, I warned everybody at the last meeting, and we kind of briefly discussed what would be included in this report. And basically, if you go to page two of our report, um, we have $443,450 that we have to add to our budget. Um, that breaks down quite simply to 265,000 for direct COVID related items. Uh, we also will be adding oxygen storage rooms, enhanced uh, lockers for the staff and negative pressure capability for every bedroom. Um, that's uh, 78,000. That's considerably lower than we thought it was a month. So that's kind of good news on that part of it. Plus, we're also going to upgrade the uh, call systems in the entire building because this is the time to be doing that. And that has a price tag of 100,250. That grand total adds up to 443,450 to add to our budget. Now, the opportune time for adding it is is right now. Uh, because we got an additional $4.3 million from the province in July. Um, it goes directly to this project, but also has an impact on the entire county when you look at our borrowing capabilities and where we can spend money. Um, the part that we need you to discuss and give us some direction on is whether or not you want to increase the size of the dining room areas to accommodate full distancing. Uh, we're still on paper, so now's the time to do that. There are consequences if we do that. It will delay the start of actual construction, and it could possibly add as much as 2% extra 
uh, just because if we drift into next year for actual construction, you may see the construction costs uh, escalate that much. Uh, this is the best guess we can get working with all of our construction managers and uh, advisors with regards to this project. Uh, that's 750,000. Uh, we have laid out both the operational argument for it and the financial argument that makes it one of those not necessary, but you may choose to do it. And now's the time you have to do that. Uh, we have to, after today's meeting, bring back our sense of urgency to get this job done and get shovels in the ground and get the job rolling. Because every time we delay, it costs us more money. Uh, bottom line, if you look at the production that Jim attached to the report, which is the Terrace Lodge project summary, that tells you where all the money is coming from. And if you go to the very bottom, I think that's the most important one for our local rate payers, where it says Algon rate payer funded. Um, we have already been approved to borrow $19 million. And that was approved back in June of 2019. But because of um, some of the things we've been able to do and because of the additional funding that is coming in from the province, uh, that now drops down to $15.2 million. So this is really good news. And the $15.2 million, uh, we can absorb the 400,000 of extras directly related to COVID that we should absorb. If we were to add the 750,000 in for the dining room, that would still only bring it up to around $16 million of borrowing which is still $3 million less than we're already approved for. But having said that, you have to understand the consequences of that. Um, if we borrow $16 million for this home, that's 16 million in borrowing power. We don't have to do roads or any other uh, major projects. So there is implications for outside of the home. Uh, so basically where we are right now, we'd like to get the report accepted um, we want you to tell us whether or not we should include the dining room additions. And after we do this, we're going to put the pedal to the metal again and bring back the sense of urgency to get on with the build. Uh, frankly, we should already have shovels in the ground, but uh, COVID-19 made sure that didn't happen. But now we're in a position where we can move forward after this meeting and really push forward to make things real. And that's when the money becomes real. And as I said, the longer we delay on anything, the more it's going to cost us. We're happy to have uh, answer any questions. Both Michelle and Jim are available to answer. I will try to answer any questions that county council may have. But I think it's really important uh, that before we accept the report, that you give us clear direction whether or not the dining room at 750000 is in or out. Uh, Mr. Gordon, I'll turn things back to you and County Council. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I'll give my two cents worth. Certainly, the four hundred forty-three thousand with the uh, call center and the oxygen and the lockers—that that's a, a given, and uh, it certainly makes sense if we're when we're renovating the building to to renov or change the the call system while we're doing it. And I expect over the next two years there's going to be some unforeseen. Uh, items just like the call center that while we're here, we better do it because it's a lot cheaper to do it now than, than later. So that's why I am in favor of the 443, the 750 for the uh, uh, larger dining room. Uh, by the time this is completed, my hope is that COVID be, will be a memory and we will not need it. Um, I would, would hate to spend that kind of money. And certainly I, I understand from staff's position that more space is always a luxury, but I, in my opinion, that's one thing that we can possibly do without. And and I, as I expect, I said before, I expect there's going to be another item down the road that we need to spend just because we're in that process. So my position is yes for the 443 and no for the 750. Julie? Um, Mr. Wharton, with your consent and that of Chairman Purcell, Michelle has uh, prepared a brief presentation that would help uh, show some floor plans and perhaps provide some additional information if you feel it would be helpful. Sure, that would be great. Michelle? Um, 
You don't need it. Oh, I don't need it. Okay, good. Let me know if you can hear, if you can't hear me okay. So, real? Pardon? <laughs> I know. Well, I feel like I'm closer than six feet, so I'll leave it on. But if you can't hear me, I'll take it off. And it's it's a part of my uniform now. Every day I, I live with this. So thank you, Mr. Warden and Councillor Purcell, for the opportunity to share my presentation uh, today. I will outline two options for council consideration in regards to the dining room areas, uh, the current dining room design, and the enhanced dining room design. And I'll outline the impact to the resident quality of life and um, to routines to staff and ability to meet resident care needs, infection prevention and control, and the operational and capital costs to the overall project. In 2018, our working group uh, met and we developed the design and we did the functional plan for Terrace Lodge Redevelopment Project. That group included Terrace Lodge frontline staff from all departments and the entire management team and MMMC and Gail Kaufman Carlin, the consultant that we hired to support the project. I'm going to be honest with you, we had a lot of discussions back then about dining room size and challenges during the design stage. The goal certainly at that time conversations were we need a larger dining room and we started with a larger dining room, but adjustments were made based on other areas to be funded. And we knew there was limitations with where we landed in the project, but we optimized floor space by minimizing the walls between the dining room and the corridor. At the end of the day, the current design does meet design standards of 30 square feet per resident. A point I wanted to just make sure every councillor understood, but you probably do, but just a refresher, every resident does spend on average three to four and a half hours per day in the dining room for meals of their waking hours. I'm just gonna have uh, Carolyn jump to, uh, do you have the big diagrams, the drawings? Maybe show it a little bit better. Oh, I might be already. Drawing one. I think it's about the same size. So that brown shaded area is your current design of the current dining room. Uh, the top of the screen is the north side of the of the building, and the bottom of the screen is the south side. Um, if you look at the dining room on the north side, the bottom part there, Carolyn. It uh, does show that we opened up the dining room to optimize the floor space by minimizing the walls between the corridor and the dining room. Oh, yeah, that does. That does better. <laughs> so typically, you would have two small entryways into a dining room, and we knew that the size of this dining room was going to be a challenge for us. So those two support beams that you see there, they can't be moved, so they'll stay there. But we thought if we have that extra space, that would be helpful for us. If you look at that 3D view of our current design, um, you can see that uh, physical distancing cannot be accommodated within the pre-pandemic dining room space, should it be required during future outbreaks and pandemics. Uh, certainly in 2018, physical distancing requirements were not contemplated during the design stages. Uh, currently at Turret Terrace Lodge, um, if you go back to the first diagram, uh, it, and on the left hand side in the core of the building where the current dining room is 88 residents do sit in that main area there for dining pre pandemic and the other 12 residents are on the lower north unit uh, for their dining because it's a challenge for them to come on and off the unit. We are not able during the pandemic to bring those 88 residents to the main dining room for a couple of reasons 50 residents from upstairs come on the elevator and we can only have two people on the elevator versus four. So the quartering time plus the space does not permit us to have 80 residents in that area. So along with other long-term care homes across the province, what we've had to do is have dining on the resident home area. So we're utilizing our lounges for about six residents and then up and down the hallways, uh, we have tables and chairs set up for residents for dining as well as in the resident rooms if they're in isolation or if we just run out of spots in the hallways to accommodate within that six feet of social distancing or physical distancing. And this has been validated at networking meetings across uh, our groups with FOG, uh, so facility operator groups and Advantage Board and Region 1 meetings. We'll go to the next slide, Karen. So, this is a 
We need for Rod Sterling to show up. <laughs> Are we good with? Yes. Yeah. Okay, carry on, Michelle. Okay. So during the pandemic, physical distancing has proven to the long-term care sector that it has been and continues to be effective as an important aspect of infection prevention and control principles. Uh, throughout, since the onset of pandemic, we've been having many discussions with public health and in particular related to dining and physical distancing. In early June, I did send some photos to our local public health unit with uh, plexiglass options, one being a crisscross across the table um, to see if we could have four residents coming up to one table. Uh, that was not supported by public health and I knew that going in, but I wanted to have that conversation. More so because each resident would have to physically be right up against the table and not turn their head side to side. We know in long-term care that we have the large chairs, many with the tray in front, and so we would not be able to achieve that physical distancing. But what they did support is a plexiglass option on a table with two residents and with the table six feet apart. So today I'm going to show you within our current design, if physical distancing was required, a couple of options. The first option being two sittings and the second option being uh, three areas or three rooms for meals. Uh, Gail Kaufman and Carlin, our consultant, did have some conversation with her local public health con contact and that feedback with new and emerging infectious diseases before effective treatments and vaccines would be developed. Controlling them will rely on infection prevention and control principles, such as currently in place with, for COVID. So the physical distancing, the universal masking, the screening, the control of entry to homes, there is a good chance we may see some seasonality to COVID-19 similar to other respiratory viruses. So if you think about influenza and how that changes. Uh, the approximate vaccine timelines for COVID-19 are unknown. And of course, growing antibiotic resistance to organisms is a concerning trend. The next slide. So the current design, and I'm gonna use drawing number one. Carolyn to speak to this one, so if you could go to that. I'm gonna share some regulations from the Long-Term Care Act and Ontario Regulation 7910 that speak specifically to meal service. Every resident must have sufficient time to eat at his or her own pace. Meals must not be served to residents who require assistance until someone is available to provide that assistance. Every resident must be provided with the aids, the devices, and the personal assistance and encouragement to allow him or her to eat and drink comfortably and independently as possible. Full breakfast must be available up to 8.30 a.m. and the evening meal cannot be served before 5 p.m. There must be a minimum of one staff member per dining room at all times. So if we look at drawing number one, and if we're going to go with two sittings or the staggered meal times, we would need to have 12 to 13 residents at each of those six sittings because our RHAs, our resident home areas, are 25 beds. So, for example, we had 13 residents at sitting number one in that dining room. You can see the size of the new north wing, which is the entire length of the top and down the right hand side of that diagram. So two PSWs would be required to assist the 12 to 13 residents, and the third PSW would be responsible for 
for monitoring and providing all of the care needs for the remaining of those residents. We know in long-term care, most residents require two staff for transfers and toileting. So we know that if we're going to do two sittings, which have been done by many other homes and not successfully, that we would require additional staffing of the nursing department to support that. Additionally, if we had two sittings, uh, then the person who does a snack cart, which would be the PSW, and that's done three times a day between meals and after supper, uh, would need to make sure in their mind, I have to serve the snack cart to the people that were the first sitting. So they would go up and down the hall getting the, the staff of the residents that were first sitting and then back down the hall again to do the residents that were the second sitting for snack cart. So those are some of the challenges that would be felt uh, by doing two sitting option. It also disruptive and confusing for residents. And, uh, but the benefit is of course, that it would be zero capital costs, but through discussions with the management team, extensive, dis extensive discussions, the best case for staffing would be an increase of 36 hours of PSW per day. So that's nine hours per resident home area to cover those three meal times. Next slide, Carolyn. So option B of the current design would be having three dining areas per resident home area. So I'll have you pull up plot diagram number three and diagram number four. That's okay. We're good. So we'll go to diagram number three. So I can show you the three areas. And this is through discussion with um, MMMC. And so just determining what would be the best areas. So you can see in the shaded green as you enter the in the north side um, at the top on the immediate right, there's a shaded area that's green. That's the activity room in the current design. So we would have four residents dining in that area. And then in the main dining room, we can have up to 12 to 14 residents in that area. Go all the way to the end of the hall and do a quick right, the lounge, the colored in green right there, uh, would be turned into a dining room for seven residents. So we go back to the standards, which says one staff must be in the dining room at all times. We have three staff members, three PSW staff members. Uh, so two would be required for that room that has 12 to 14 residents, one in the room that has one re or three, three to four residents. And then you would need another staff person in the lounge area for the dining room. You can also see that travel distance for the dietary staff and the nursing staff for meal service. So it's up and down the hall, um, not an effective use of staff time. Uh, it's very disruptive and confusing for residents who will be temporarily reassigned di dining locations during times of physical distancing. Uh, certainly a change of staff routines and practices, but also loss of the lounge and the activity room space for residents during already challenging times because you, we wouldn't want to be setting up that lounge, taking out large furniture and cozy chairs to set up tables and chairs three times a day, that type of thing. Of course, we have the same increase in operational costs. We would not be able to do that without an extra PSW <laughs> meal service. And so best case scenario would be 36 hours of PSW per day uh, to cover those three meal times. Next slide, Carolyn. Go past the 
drawings there. So just a recap of the current design, whether it's option A of two sittings or option B of having three dining locations, it would be the same impact. We would need 36 hours of PSW per day. At the 2021 rate, that's a cost estimate of $1,134 per day plus benefits. Uh, important to note that those financials do not include escalation over time. But I will share with Council that uh, through the recent negotiations with SEIU, we were successful in obtaining a letter of understanding in the collective agreement where we can discuss potential new classification. So that could potentially decrease those costs. In the future, if there was a pandemic or another significant outbreak, uh, is you know, the question would be would the redeployed staff who we relied on so heavily be available to us as well as pandemic funding? If not, there would be additional operational costs would be likely because we have relied heavily on those redeployed staff, our adult day program staff, managers, recreation and housekeeping to support our process. And that's continuing at this time in our homes. Also, recreation have been helping us with mealtime service. All of our staff, all departments have had a significant impact to their role um, at in our, in our homes with the pandemic, as all of you have as well. But the most uh, biggest change, I think, would be the recreation department who went from providing programs and therapies to really they're doing mealtime assistance and they're managing uh, the virtual visits, the window visits, the indoor and the outdoor visits. And that has had a significant impact on our residents' quality of life. And so we would have to reevaluate re re that if there was a future situation. And Jim's uh, financials included in your package, he speaks to the payback of capital costs uh, being in X number of years for each of the scenarios provided, uh, either 11 years or 15 years. I just want to say that we can't be held to this because we really don't know when or if a pandemic would happen again. But what we do know is that it's been 11 years since H1N1, which was a mild pandemic, and 17 years since SARS. Uh, if any of you were um, had caught Dr. Teresa Tam last week, her news release in regards to providing an update to the pandemic, she's the, of course, you know, Canada's chief public health officer. Some of the comments from her news release is that she was asking us to temper our expectations related to the speed and efficacy of a vaccine. She stressed the importance of physical distancing, proper hand hygiene, and mask wearing. She asked us to attempt to dispel any notion that a vaccine will make life go back to the way it was a couple of months ago. She told us to plan for longer terms, quoting next, the next two to three years. She said it's unclear about the efficacy of a vaccine. What will be the degree and duration of immunity? What will the dosing needed be? There's uncertainty around whether the vaccine would prevent us from getting sick altogether, or would it simply prevent severe illness requiring hospitalization? Once the vaccine is tested and deemed safe and effective, there will be challenges with distributing it widely to those who need it. There likely will not be enough vaccine for the population. She was cautiously optimistic that a safe and effective vaccine will be available by the end of the year, stating physical distancing could be required even after a vaccine is found. A vaccine is one important layer of protection. Next slide, please. So I've talked about the current design options and I'm just gonna to present to council an enhanced dining room option. This is drawing five and six. So if you want us to that drawing five, uh, this is the preferred option from the management team perspective along with uh, Gail Kaufman, Carlin, our consultants, uh, her input. So you can see the current dining room at the top of your screen. Directly below that is the option that I'm presenting to you today. So it's the second dining room directly across from the current dining room. It is an additional 578 square feet of dining area where we can seat two per table and six foot separation can be maintained. There's a relocation of those two bedrooms that were to see the new dining room. So those were two bedrooms. They've been relocated. And if you want to just cover your mouse over those, Carolyn. 
the two new bedrooms um, yeah, in the addition. So uh, they're relocated into the addition. An unanticipated benefit to relocating those two bedrooms that I just, we had an aha moment about that the other day um, is that in phase three, we have six to 10 months of time where residents are doubled up temporarily uh, for six to 10 months time in a single room. So it's a tighter space than what they're in right now at Terrace Lodge. Uh, so 44 residents will be doubled up, but by moving those two bedrooms to this area, that drops that number to 28 residents. So 14 rooms instead of 22 rooms. So that was an unanticipated value of the change. Uh, the cost, however, to, uh, there is a capital cost to this, and that's estimated to be $750,000, which Councillor Purcell did share with you as well. I got an email on the weekend from Advantage Ontario, our association, which was sharing information about COVID-19 infrastructure program. I'm not sure if any of the councillors have heard or seen that information, uh, but we will apply for any funds which we may be uh, eligible. The working group will look at our project schedule to see if there's anything which we could have completed using a broad definition, even if not operational until the end of the project. So we'll keep council informed if there's any opportunities for funding in that regard. And Carolyn, if you wanna to go to slide diagram six. So that's the two dining room, that's the 3D view. So having a look at that, you can see if we compare it to, um, I'll have to back so much, but we'll go back to diagram two at the end. So we're able to more comfortably seat all residents, particularly the higher percentage of residents with large chairs. If you look at noise attenuation, and when we go back to diagram number two, you'll see how close the proximity of, of residents is, volume of noise with moving chairs, moving tables, uh, the clinking, clanking of, of cutlery and plates, uh, versus this setup with the space and the two dining rooms. This will be improved uh, in noise attenuation for those that are hearing impaired and for those with challenging or mental health issues. This option also allows us to pro provide more options for seating residents with challenging behaviors, and it provides additional space for staff and residents to navigate around tables and for staff to sit as per the standards to provide mealtime assistance, uh, the queuing, the feeding, the monitoring, and the biggest thing here is, uh, well, one of the biggest things is the ability for residents to enter and exit the dining room as desired on their own timing, eliminating the need to shift other residents to provide necessary access between tables. So Carolyn, if you can take us back to drawing number two, if I'm sitting at the window um, and I'm coming late to the dining room, and this is what we deal with on a regular basis, but it's not a pleasant or pleasurable dining experience. So we're having to move either two or three residents away from their table. Mr. Jones, I'm sorry, we're just gonna pull you away from your table. Mr. Purcell, we need to pull you away from your table because Ms. Ganyu is just coming into the dining room. So to accommodate that, we're, we're shuffling people around to get them to their table. Also, if I'm sitting at that same area near the window, and I have a bathroom emergency or I'm uh, family's here to pick me up to go on an outing or I have an appointment or I just don't like to stay in the dining room once I'm done. Same thing, we need to shuffle two or three people away from the table to uh, be able to accommodate their request to enter or exit the dining room. Um, additionally, if we go back to diagram six, there is additional space for families and visitors to assist with meals. If you reflect back on the diagram two, um, compare that to this diagram, certainly this overall ambience of this dining room option is such as a restaurant setting. And when physical distancing is not required, right now we have them set up in a row light setting to ensure that we're meeting that six feet. But if it was not required, we could do more random placement of the tables. Uh, it also increases the options for seating plans, the ability to co-locate residents of similar ability and cognitive function, and provides an additional room for small group activities between meals and the evening. This room would be utilized 365 days per year for both dining and programming. There would be zero increase to nursing operational costs due to the very close proximity of two dining areas. So we can have 14 residents in the larger dining room with two PSW staff. 
in the hallway, the, the registered staff would be there doing her medication pass, providing supervision and assistance support with the third PSW in the smaller dining area. There would be no additional housekeeping wages because this setup is would actually take no extra time to clean. Uh, the other dining room setup is a more congested. You're moving more furniture around to do the cleaning. Uh, housekeeping staff is confident that this setup would not uh, require any additional housekeeping wages. So from the management team perspective, we do feel this is a good use of additional funds from the ministry because there are significant qualitative benefits for the resident quality of life and it offers an improved home for our residents. The, dining room, the enhanced dining room option would best meet any physical physical distancing requirements uh, to support best practice for current and probable ongoing infection prevention control principles in a communal living environment. So the lessons learned have really heightened our awareness around the needs of that physical space, whether it's uh, an enteric outbreak or a respiratory outbreak or otherwise. I realize this is a very significant ask. And as the director of the homes, I can say that the management team has spent a great deal of time looking at the options and giving consideration uh, to cost and um, has taken this very seriously. I've attempted to prevent or present the benefits and the cost to council to assist in your decision. And I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you may have, as I'm sure Jim is as well. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Questions for Michelle or Jim or Bob in regard to the. Ed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. Uh, Michelle, are you experiencing similar dining room experience difficulties at the other two facilities? So it's it's better at the other two facilities because they're newer homes and the setup and the space is larger. Okay. Um, with Elgin Manor, it's almost like having that second dining room right across because they have a, a very a much larger lounge than what we have at Terrace Lodge. So they're utilizing those areas similar to how I've just presented to you. Um, so Elgin Manor is managing in that in that manner, but they are utilizing their lounge, but they also have a very large activity room right next to that area. So they have that capability at Bobier Villa. They're using again, they have uh, a really lovely dining room for um, the two areas and the third area. Magnolia Lane has their own dining room. So they have um, prepped over into the adult day program space at this time, but they're managing with the current staffing. So and this, very far larger in those homes. Go ahead, Thank you, Mr. Warden. As a follow-up, uh, you mentioned something about uh, the elevator currently being, uh, forget the term, a choke point at this point, because you are limited to two occupants rather than four for moving down. How is this going to be mitigated? Uh, is this still going to be a problem even with a larger dining room? No. That's what I'm asking is, is this going to make a difference? So when we have the new building, the redevelopment, yes. the um, dining rooms are actually in the resident home area. So residents will not need to come down on the elevator for meals. Thank you. Welcome. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, you say you relocate two bedrooms. So I assume the number of bedrooms will remain the same. Exactly. That was my concern when I first saw it was that we were might be losing some accommodation, but. No, the number will remain at 100. Thank you. Duncan? Um, you know, I read the report uh, quite carefully and then I've heard uh, Michelle sent the report and, uh, you know, as, as council, we sit here and uh, we're deliberating over a plan that's going to be in place for probably the next 45 or 50 years. Uh, unfortunately, many of us in this room, our best before date will be long expired before this decision has to be made again. So I, I think keeping that in, in, in mind and, and certainly looking uh, to a fuzzy crystal ball of uh, 30, 40 years down the road, uh, it still doesn't take away the fact that currently sitting in this chair uh, that I'm in, one of my guiding principles has always been that when this council spends money, that we get value for that money. And uh, certainly listening to uh, Michelle's well thought through presentation, uh, I think she's demonstrated to me that there is value in this investment in this facility for the long term. Uh, 
uh, who knows uh, what pandemics or what uh, situations are going to come forward over the next 40, 50 years. And uh, certainly I think that uh, this council has the opportunity to uh, to look at that value for money uh, and, and uh, leave a legacy for the next 40 years that uh, that uh, we want our residents to be able to uh, enjoy their dining experience. Uh, I know speaking with my wife, the most horrible thing that she really felt when she worked in the hospital situation was patients eating in the hall. It was, she felt very, very degrading to that individual to have to sit in the hall and eat your lunch. It was sort of like a kid that got kicked out of the classroom. And, uh, I have seen, seen it personally and, and, uh, so I, I think, you know, if we look at the investment and we look at it over the next 45, 50 years, uh, the actual uh, cost of the investment really is quite minimal if it's going to enhance the resident's uh, lifestyle at the home. Uh, I think one of my major concerns with this whole project is, is I don't know if anybody has been to the uh, lumber supply store in the last little while. Uh, lumber is short, some is not available, and I don't know what that's going to do to our overall tender process when uh, you need a product and it's not available or it's in short supply. So uh, uh, certainly that's something for the, uh, for the committee to keep an eye on. Uh, and uh, uh, personally, I could, I could support the uh, investment in the uh, enhanced dining room for Terrace Lodge redevelopment. Thank you, Duncan. Any other questions, comments? Grant? Mr. Warden. Grant first, and then I've got you, Dominique. Mary. Uh, Mary? It, yes. Did, am I first or second? Sorry, Mr. Warden. You're second. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, uh, further to Councillor Purcell's uh, comments, uh, shortages are definitely there already in the lumber. Uh, lumber yards and uh, prices are going up. I just hope that when the, the committee is going out and pretender that they've talked to their uh, various uh, contractors about the availability and the pricing, if they factored that in, because I know prices have gone up already, are going to go up again from what I'm being told. So is that something uh, to Councillor Purcell? Is that something that's been factored in already? What they the crystal ball is looking like for the next year and a half. Yeah, Grant and uh, members of council, we, we're comfortable and our contractors or our, our management team and the consultants we have are all comfortable with the pricing we have till the end of this year. Um, we're anticipating at least another 2% next year if we drift into that time period for tenders and that, and that's another half a million dollars if, if that happens. Um, so there is a sense of urgency to get on with this. Um, we do know that we might have some uh, materials situations in that, but our best guests and our experts that are all involved now um, think we can make this happen as long as we can get at it. Mary, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I just want to commend Michelle on her report. Uh, it's an excellent report and if we weren't in a pandemic situation, my challenge would be that all counselors go to Terrace Lodge at a meal time and actually witness what our residents and our staff go through at every meal. Um, I think as counselors, our biggest job to worry about with our residents is their quality of life and their safety. So I'm in full favor of this. I know it's a quite a bit of money, but I also agree with Deputy Warden McPhail that I think we'll see good value for the money we spend. So I am in full agreement with what Michelle was um, saying. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mary. Tom? I have, before I get reminded, because I have sat at this table and, and said around budget time that, uh, use the phrase, I think it's nice to have or must have. But uh, I will agree with some, um, it's important to spend the money wisely. Um, I, my mom spent two years in Terrace Lodge, so I'm very familiar with it. Uh, we used to take her to church every Sunday and I go down early in the morning to get her, 
parking lot would always be empty. And I come back to two thirty, we go to Shaw's, et cetera, and the parking lot would be full. So there's kind of an example of service that um, you don't use every day, but you need it when you need it. Um, this room will be used three and a half, four, five hours a day, uh, every day, every day of the year. So I, I, I certainly support this. Um, no no uh, reflection on Mr. Gibson, but I remember in one of our meetings with Southwestern Public Health, Dr. Locke, I can't remember, but there's an article in the Toronto Lawyer has made a kind of a stinging comment. Someone on the call asked her, and she made the statement, um, I will never give legal advice. I wish he wouldn't give medical advice. So I appreciate the presentation and the, the, uh, the support from Michelle. Um, and certainly no, Jim, I appreciate what you do with keeping the pencil sharp, but uh, I'm leaning towards uh, the advice from the trained staff there. So I am going to support the 750,000. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? <laughs> Mr. Warden, it's Dominique. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm in agreement with uh, what's been said so far. Uh, I. I guess the, the most surprising and perhaps most convincing was the argument that non, in non-pandemic time, the actual design of the kitchen is suboptimum. And I've got to say, I'm a little bit surprised and if not disappointed to hear that, because I, I would say if that's the case, um, that's the most convincing argument. We, this whole plan this this reconstruction is to optimize everything and to have a state of the art facility and I, I can tell you that even as chair of the fundraising committee that's how I'm presenting it to the community that we are building the best so so I guess my two questions are first off for staff um, is there anything else that where you feel you have traded off because like I said, that, that particular bit of information was a surprise. And um, I guess to Councillor Purcell, you hit at potential delays in terms of the construction. And I wonder if you can expand on that because we also have to be aware of that. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I will jump in first. And uh, potential delays are, if we okay this, this dining room, we're gonna have to change some designs in that. And I doubt very much that we'll be able to break ground before Christmas. Uh, we will be pushed into next year. That does expose us to increased costs. Um, if we break ground this year, we're we're pretty comfortable that the tenders will come in within the what we expect. But if we get into next year, um, it's the wild west again. And a lot of a lot of the impact of home will be better known to the, for the contractors that are bidding. So uh, I, I, I think that, you know, if you want to be totally honest, you're, you're looking at the 750 and maybe even another 500,000 if we go ahead with this now. Um, the 750 is a firm number, the 500,000 is our best guess of what's happening in the marketplace and with material supplies, et cetera. Thanks, Bob, Michelle. Uh, so, great question, Councillor. Um, I'm being quite honest with you that we we really wanted a larger dining room, and we did keep making it smaller and smaller to accommodate the other required areas and that we needed in the building. And we we settled, but we worked hard to come up with a way to optimize that dining room by taking away the, the walls to make it easier to get in and out. And to actually, if we had larger chairs, they could sit partially into the hallway. Um, were we jumping up and down excited about that piece? No, we were not, but we, we thought we would make it work based on experience. But what happened is the pandemic really heightened the awareness to the importance of having the proper dining room space. And it was a very short time uh, once after pandemic started that I started to have second thoughts about the dining room. Is there other areas where I'm having second thoughts? No, uh, we were all very pleased with the plan of the entire working group uh, of frontline staff in the area where we struggled really was uh, the 
the dining room space and then the temporary double rooms. We knew that was a short time and we did a lot of mock ups to make sure that we could make that work. But it's exciting to hear this unanticipated benefit that would come to drop that down to from 44 to 28 uh, residents uh, being required to be in that space. So hopefully that answers your question. All right. Any other questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Warden, uh, Purcell. I, I would like I would like to just add to what Michelle just said. Um, the other example of that is our increase in the locker room areas for the um, pandemic um, brought that into focus better, and the dollar uh, investment is is small enough that it's not uh, it, it's just a no brainer. We go ahead and do it. Uh, the, the, the decision why we brought this part of it to county council is the dollar value of changing the dining room is significant. And we wanted to not just have the committee make that report and, and deal that we wanted all of county, county council well aware of why you should or should not make that spend. Okay, thank you, Bob. Any other questions or comments, Tom? You know, I, I guess I was kicking around my own mind um, for less than $20,000 over 40 years, we would have this addition. I appreciate um, Bob Purcell's comment about potential another uh, 500,000, but you know, when you, even at that worst case scenario, that's still not a lot of money over 40 years. I still think it's money spent wisely. Okay, thank you, Tom. Any other questions or comments? All right, Julie, we've got probably three resolutions. We need to re receive in the file, then we've got the 443 and then the 750. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Well, let's do one one at a time. First of all, receive and file the report. Correct? Okay. Mover and seconder for that. Martin. Jones, all in favor. Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councilor Martin. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Shagare. Yes. Councilor Ketchbach? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. 9 0. The motion is carried. Okay, so the next motion is the 443. Yes. Would you like me to read? Yes, please. Uh, be it resolved that the Terrace Lodge redevelopment project be supplemented with a further $443,450 of budget to allow for project construction events while still under COVID restrictions. This addition includes an allowance for known COVID 19 construction cleaning expenses plus adding oxygen storage rooms, enhanced staff locker rooms, negative pressure capability in each resident bedroom to improve the design and address concerns raised as a re result of COVID-19. Simultaneously, the nurse call system in the common building core will be updated. Okay, thank you. Mover and seconder for that motion, please. Move Purcell. Move by Purcell, seconded by Marks, all in favor. Lady Warden McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councillor Marks? Yes. Councillor Martin? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor French? Yes. Councillor Shagir? Yes. Councillor Ketchbaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. 9 0. The motion is carried. Okay. Now the next motion. Uh, whereas a further $750,000 investment to increase dining space will provide a permanent physical distancing solution and improve operational efficiencies. We are asking County Council to decide today if they want this option included in the final design. So there be it resolved that County Council considered the option of adding a further $750,000 to the Terrace Lodge development project to allow for enhanced dining space, weighing the advantages and disadvantages of said investment. So the resolution would be that Council invest $750,000 for enhanced dining space. Okay, thanks, Julie. Mover and second for that. McPhail. Ketchabah. Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Councillor Purcell. No. Councillor Martin. Yes. Councillor Marks. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor French. Yes. Councillor Jaguar. Yes. Councilor Ketchbaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? No. 7 2. The motion is carried. Great. Thank you, Julie. Uh, is Annie and Isaac? 
available? They're there. We just have to come out of um, committee of the whole in order to consider another delegation. Okay. So, Secretary, come out of committee of the whole. Martin, all in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail? Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Martin? Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Schaefer? Yes. Councilor Ketchabaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. 9 0, the motion is carried. Okay, good morning, Annie and Isaac. I hope you're there. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> This is a, a certainly a, a, a pleasure for me to congratulate both of you. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, Ms. Watson and Mr. Clutterbuck for their dedication to their studies and their innovative focus on the future of agriculture in Elgin County. It's not been an easy year, particularly for students. However, you have excelled in your studies and represent a new generation dedicated to the development of fresh ideas that ensure that our rural way of life is sustainable and economically viable for years to come. Annie is from uh, Central Elgin. She's uh, pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture at the University of Guelph. And her focus on is on sustainable farming practices. Isaac Clutterbuck is from Southold. And he's actually he's a grandson of Perry Clutterbuck, who is former warden and mayor of Southold. Uh, he's pursuing a Bachelor of Science at the University of Guelph. And he's <coughs> stable food supply, especially in the light of COVID-19. So congratulate both of you for this $2,500 for your scholarship, and hopefully that uh, your studies at the University of Guelph will be successful coming this year. So, uh, Thank you. Comments from, uh, go ahead, Annie. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for one, selecting me for the scholarship and two, for presenting it to me. I really appreciate the time and dedication that you guys set aside, not only for Elgin, but just to make sure that everything runs smoothly in the county. And I just want to say thank you again. And I really hope I'm going to spend this money wisely. I know I will. And I hope that my year goes good this year. So thank you. Thank you, Annie. Any comments, Isaac? Um, again, the uh... Basically, she summed everything up that I was going to say as well. Thank you for selecting me, and uh, uh, I hope I, this help. This will really help my me achieve my goal in education. Okay, thank you, Isaac, and congratulations to both of you. Thank you. Okay, we got to move back in the committee of the whole. All right, Mr. Wolf, go, go ahead, Tom. You know, this is, I think this is the last uh, scholarship from the following match. One more? Okay. Uh, Annie is my neighbor. Oh, she. If I get in my truck, invariably I pass the farm. It's just a, two farms down. So I, when I read this in the package here, I was delighted. Um, certainly great neighbors. Um, Annie's dad and I have the distinction. We have never moved off for this time. So uh, very proud of you. Good girl. And, and thank you, Tom. Clutterbuck is a well respected name in this room. So, congratulations to both. Thank you. <laughs> Be careful. Take care, folks. Move in second and move, move back into a committee of the whole. <laughs> Jones and Ketchabal, all in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail? Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Martin? Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Jaguar? Yes. Councilor Ketchabaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. 9 0. The motion is carried. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I guess we're back into planning. Nancy, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, the first report is a uh, information report on the recent enacted changes to the provincial policy statement, which are now in effect as of May 1st, actually 2020. There are several changes that uh, will ultimately affect the county's official plan, but I wanted to highlight the changes uh, made to the planning horizon from 20 to 25 years and the extended minimum to accommodate residential growth from 10 to 15 years. This could affect the county as these uh, new requirements mean reviewing the county's land needs and reassessing the adequacy of lands for uh, development. Um, this also means that uh, the upcoming five-year review for the official plan uh, will require some land needs assessments, 
as well as potentially population uh, projections and some review of employment lands, uh, which will ultimately impact the budget for 2021. Um, I'm available for any questions if anyone wants to ask anything specific. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Questions for Nancy? Duncan? Yeah, Mr. Warden, uh, through you. Um, with the changes in the provincial policy statement, is there anything in there that is going to affect rural communities when it comes to uh, uh, agricultural severances uh, for residential? Uh, through you, Mr. Warden, uh, nothing specific to severances. Um, I haven't seen any changes to the legislation with re related to that. There have been some additional um, wording or verbiage added to the provincial policy statement about development on lands that are not serviced, um, but it seems to be tied to uh, areas that are in settlement boundaries. Um, so those will continue, I think. We, through the county, we have that three-tiered system, so it kind of already allows for severances in areas that don't necessarily have services. Um, but in terms of agricultural land uh, severances, there was no changes to that. That satisfy you, Duncan? Yes. Okay. Any other questions for Nancy? Seeing none, motion to receive and file the report. Jones. M Martin, all in favor? Deputy Warden McPhail? Yes. Councillor Purcell? Yes. Councillor Martin? Yes. Councillor Marks? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor French? Yes. Councillor Jaguar? Yes. Councillor Ketchbaum? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. Zero, the motion is carried. Thank you. You've got the next one on the official plan amendment, Nancy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. This report is on the official plan amendment at 349 George Street, which is in Port Stanley. Um, the official plan amendment ultimately is to the municipality of Central Elgin. Um, their official plan and the recommendation is to redesignate the lands from a natural heritage uh, to a residential and to change the natural hazards overlay on the site. Um, this is only for a portion of the lands, uh, th but this change will ultimately recognize uh, the area of the existing dwelling and there's an accessory structure as well on the site. And will ultimately allow for a proposed severance in the future on the west side of the property. Um, uh, so that that change will ultimately be able to incorporate that. I'm also available for any questions. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Questions for Nancy? Seeing none, mover and seconder for the report. Uh, Marks? Catch a ball, all in favor. Deputy Warden McPhail? Yes. Councillor Purcell? Yes. Councillor Martin? Yes. Councillor Marks? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor French? Yes. Councillor Jaguar? Yes. Councillor Ketchabaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. 9 0, the motion is carried. Thank you. Brian, you're doing the next one on library and museums. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, this report provides Council with an update uh, on services for library, museum, and archives effective as of today. Um, library has expanded curbside service to two days per week at all branches except Almer, which is now at three days a week. Uh, the Museum and Heritage Center are now open to the public. On a drop in basis, um, subject to visitor limits of 3 persons or 2 um, social circles or families. And the archives is available to researchers on an appointment only basis. Uh, for all of these services, they are all subject to the procedures we have established, which place the health and safety of residents and staff. As the top priority, um, we are taking a cautious approach. When it comes to providing more services, uh, particularly for library. Uh, even though we could open our interior spaces under phase three for checkout of materials, uh, use of computers and even programming. Um, we still do not have the full staffing capacity to provide this level of service. And we also just really want to uh, continue to focus on providing high quality. Curbside and online uh, resources. Uh, one service that we have added is a virtual reference and advisory service. Um, on recommended reads or what we call readers advisory. So we're finding other ways to reach out. To provide those services uh, remotely, uh, but still on a one-on-one -on -one basis with staff or with um, patrons. Um, we still have staff assisting in our long-term care homes, and we have to keep that need in mind as we transition to providing our services, which is why we're looking at September the earliest for some form of phase three services, and that also dovetails with um, the uh, return to plan for, for schools. 
And uh, one final point I'll make is that um, we are going to continue to work on developing our digital resources, and that has really served us well through the uh, the onset of the pandemic. Uh, we've been able to service a number of inquiries um, uh, through the resources we've made available online, and we're going to continue that work. So that could mean and uh, further development of uh, virtual story times to uh, more virtual exhibits and to further digitization of archival uh, resources so that we continue to provide those remote services. So with that in mind, I am happy to answer any questions council might have. Thank you, Brian. Questions for Brian on his report? Sally? Not a question, just a comment. I, I certainly have appreciated and very much used the e-books throughout the pandemic. I, uh, I very much appreciate Elgin's um, ability. It's easy to surf through. It's much better. I, I'm a member of St. Thomas as well, and uh, but I much prefer the Elgin County one. Um, so I, I just want to commend you on that. I'm glad to hear that the museum is open. It's going to be difficult, but uh, and the archives. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Sally. Any other questions for Brian on his report? Seeing none, mover and seconder for Brian's report. Moved by Martin. Seconder. Yeah. Jagair, all in favor? Thank Warden McPhail. Yes. Councillor Purcell? Yes. Councillor Martin? Yes. Councillor Marks? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor French? Yes. Councillor Jagair? Yes. Councillor Ketchbaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. 9 0, the motion is carried. Thank you. Mike, are you there? Uh, I'm here, yep. Okay, your report on procurement? Great. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, through you to County Council. So this uh, quarterly procurement activity report details the awards of contracts that were approved by directors valued between 15,000 and 250,000. This report is from the period of uh, April to June of this year. The list of the projects, the amounts, and the approved suppliers attached as Appendix A. All of the contracts comply with the county's procurement policy. Recommendation is the report be received and filed, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. Question for Mike on his report. Seeing none, mover and seconder for his report. Uh, McPhail, seconder, Marks, all in favor. Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Shaguer? Yes. Councilor Ketchava? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. So the motion is carried. Thank you. Mike, you're doing the insurance as well? Uh, yes, thank you again, Mr. Warden, uh, through you to County Council. So this uh, insurance uh, report provides a brief update to Council regarding the upcoming renewal in December. Uh, staff became aware of a number of municipalities reporting some significant increases in their insurance premium rate this year. Our current insurer indicated that the market is unpredictable and rapidly changing. Fortunately for the county, about half of our total policy costs is fixed for one additional year. We may see some increases in property, crime, and the auto portions of the policy, uh, which we'll get, which we'll know uh, as we get closer to the real time. It's very likely that the 2022 policy renewal will be challenging as our cost guarantee will no longer be a factor. So additional information on the actual increase for 2021 will be reported to council prior to the renewal in December. Uh, for council's information, our total policy cost for 2020, including our cyber liability policy was about $332,000. Recommendations report received and filed. I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. Questions for Mike on the insurance? Ed? Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. Mike, how long has the county been with JTL? Uh, so this, uh, we've been uh, two years. Uh, next year will be our third year. Okay, so maybe it's a little quick then to uh, go to market for the 2022 season? Um, I think I think having our cost guarantee for uh, yes, sorry for 2022, yes, to be be a little quick. We probably want to look at that uh, sometime next year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, just uh, an information point. This is a matter that's uh, very much on the on uh, the radar for the Municipal Law Department Association of Ontario. It's it's a matter that is being studied for or throughout the uh, province municipalities of varying sizes and uh, certainly there are um, uh, options being considered uh, with respect to uh, any uh, 
any steps that can be taken perhaps to limit the uh, rapidly increasing costs throughout the province. Okay, thanks, Steve. Questions for uh, Mike or Steve? Seeing none, mover and seconder for Mike's report, please. Jones and Ketchabaugh, all in favor? Deputy Warden McPhail? Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Martin? Yes. 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 Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Shaguer? Yes. Councilor Ketchabaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. I do. The motion is carried. Thank you. Jim, are you there for the next report? <clears throat> I am, Mr. Ward. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, this report is the June 2020 financial update. Uh, it serves two purposes. One, to show you the uh, performance to date versus budget. Also, to talk to you about cash flow and, and, and debt. Um, as it relates to uh, performance to budget in June, we had 68,000 of favorable performance, uh, which is predominantly in wages due to redeployed staff. And that brings our year to date performance to 341,000. Uh, I presented a cash flow in May, and during that uh, presentation, we discussed doing a pull ahead of a portion of 35 million. There's a uh, close 12 million of the 35 million of debt that we were going to uh, acquire as part of financing the the 10 year capital plan. And uh, the there was a discussion pulling that 12 million ahead because of cash flow concerns. Uh, the concerns in cash flow were related to. Uh, in particular, the uh, the delays in receiving of our levy payments. Uh, we were predicting that there would be a 25% reduction or, or delay in levy payments, um, but actually the June actuals came in with 95% of the money coming in. So that, that was much better than anticipated. So if it was just from a pure cash flow perspective, uh, we would probably be able to survive through this year without a need for debt. However, the COVID situation has has given council an opportunity to consider debt earlier rather than later because of changes in interest rate. With the downturn in the economy, interest rates have really dropped. And uh, we're now in a position uh, based on current rates where that are well below 2% on a 10-year uh, debt instrument through Infrastructure Ontario. Um, that it could make economic sense for us actually to, regardless of the cash flow need, to to lock into that debt. Um, and we have some GICs that are cash flow GICs that are earning approximately two percent that we could hold on to through 2021, and and lock into a debt that's below that, and we would then benefit from 10 years of that lower debt interest rate. We could wait till next year. My guess is that debt will still be low a year from now because I don't see the economy necessarily improving. But it doesn't doesn't hurt to lock in early um, and and to take advantage of the rates that are presented right now. In order to do that, uh, we would need to <clears throat> adjust our bylaw from the budget time to allow for debt in 2020. <clears throat> and so before you today will be a budget amendment bylaw to allow for $12 million of debt um, in 2020. And uh, with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Jim. I think it's probably a wise decision. Any questions for Jim, Ed? Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. Jim, uh, can you confirm that you're planning on borrowing from Infrastructure Ontario, or are you thinking about another private creditor? Uh, I don't believe anybody can come close to the infrastructure Ontario rates, as well as the fact that they offer what I'll call a clean loan. Um, if you look at uh, when you go to private banks, uh, they will put together a, a complex debt instrument, which will have other risks hidden in it. Whereas with infrastructure Ontario, it's a simple venture guaranteed loan interest rates over the term of the loan. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden, if I may continue. Jim, um, my understanding is that Infrastructure Ontario may be a little reticent to uh, lend that far in advance of the need of those funds. So whether you've explored that or not, I'm not aware. 
Uh, my understanding on certificate yield rates would be very comparable to what uh, the lending rate for infrastructure in Ontario would be, so it would be a wash. And I think that's a good idea at this point, actually. In principle, I'm in favor of it. Uh, providing the detail, the devil is in the details, actually. Um, as it relates to the, the borrowing, um, what we're really doing is, I, I think what Tom is looking at is we're borrowing against a, our capital plan. And in that capital plan, we're spending um, $100 million plus dollars over the mm -hmm. coming 10 years. Uh, this year, we have two major projects that are worth $12 million, uh, being one road and uh, the bridge in Port Stanley. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't be borrowing in advance of those projects. Uh, so Infrastructure Ontario has actually already pre-approved us on those on those projects. Um, and so what would happen is next month, I would prepare a report to bring to council. I would ask Infrastructure Ontario to provide us the rates. It would do that five days in advance of council. And we would then be able to walk in a bylaw for council to approve to allow the warden to sign to enter into an agreement with Infrastructure Ontario on that debt. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Jim? Okay. Yes, Mr. Warren. Thank you. Um, as it relates to the the CERB program coming to an end here uh, in the foreseeable future. Have you had any questions with anyone uh, regarding the fact that is that going to affect our revenue stream? I certainly have concerns in, two, in 2021 on how the economy is going to impact our revenue stream. Um, I think the reason that we have done so well in 2020 is because there's been so much federal money pumped into the system through the SERP program and other assistance to, uh, to small businesses that have kept people well, um, at some point in time, those funds are going to diminish and then the true impact of the economic downturn is going to be felt. So that is going to be something that we'll have to, to consider as, as the finance committee uh, comes together to consider the 2021 budget. But on the flip side, we have some good news on interest rates that will help offset some of that back. Tom? I, I just like to say, I think this is a, a, a great example of um, Jim keeping the pencil very sharp. So thank you for that. Any other questions for Jim? See, none of we got a resolution, Julie, that reflects Jim's suggestion. Yes. So be it resolved that uh, the report be received and filed for information as well that a 2020 budget amending bylaw be approved to amend bylaw 20-08 to allow council to consider a debenture bylaw this year. Okay, thank you, Julie. Mover and seconder. Tom. Purcell. And Purcell, all in favor? Deputy Warden. Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Martin? Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councillor Jaguar. Yes. Councillor Ketchbaum. Yes. And Mr. Warden. Yes. Sir, the motion is carried. Thank you. Brian, are you there? I am. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Belmont Road, ped pedestrian crossroads. Thank you, Mr. Warden, through the County Council. A request from the municipality of Central Elgin seeking approval to install a pedestrian crossover on Belmont Road immediately north of Union Street within the village of Belmont has been received. Details are uh, noted in the staff reports. The proposed installation complies with Ontario Traffic Link Book 15 pedestrian crossing treatments and will include rapid flashing beacons and curb bump outs intended to shorten the crossing distance for pedestrians and enhance the crossing's visibility for motorists. The proposed pedestrian crossing, while not warranted, will be fully funded by the municipality of Central Elgin and is recommended for staff approval. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brian. Question for Brian on this one, Sally? Just a comment. This is something we strongly feel is important because speeding is a real problem down that main county road through the downtown of Belmont. And this, with the bump out as well as the crosswalk, it will certainly slow traffic. And it's it's at an ideal location 
where uh, the amenities are all right nearby. So we, we feel this. We're also doing a, a crossover under the bridge, which is a totally different thing, but that's a hiking trail from the new new subdivisions to the uh, to the main area of Belmont, um, but that doesn't lead to the amenities. This one will allow people to walk uh, where the new amenities are. Okay, thank you, Zoe. Tom? And, uh, certainly, I agree. And it's great news for the people in Belmont. Uh, I remember campaigning down there and many, many says with, with the traffic morning and afternoon, um, it's unsafe to cross. And I'll, I'm glad this is happening, but I, I really struggle. What would it take for the county to think this was necessary? You know, if you, if you sit down there, watch that traffic for the kids to cross, because it really divides the village. I'm glad it's happening. Um, I think my mind is in the mayor's is very necessary, but you, you comment that um, it's not warranted. What would it take to be warranted? That's hey, Mr. Warden. A lot of parents would ask down there. Go ahead, Tom. Three, Mr. Warden, um, in accordance with the county's policy, warrants uh, are, are derived in accordance with the Ontario uh, traffic manual. So um, it's, it's a it's a combination of both uh, traffic volumes, traffic counts, as well as pedestrian crossing uh, during a certain period of time. Um, the latter currently doesn't exist that would uh, necessitate or warrant uh, the installation of pedestrian crossing at this time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. Any other questions for Brian? Duncan? Uh, through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, Brian, can I safely assume that a crosswalk in any municipality on a county road in Elgin will be around the forty forty five thousand dollar investment uh, mark. That would be a safe assumption. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Brian? See none. There's a recommendation from staff. Mover and second over that. Martin. Marks. All in favor. Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councilor Martin. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Jagger. Yes. Councilor Ketchabon. Yes. Mr. Warden. Yes. Nine zero. The motion is carried. Thank you, Brian Centennial Avenue. Thank you, Mr. Warden. In response to a request from the Municipality of Central Elgin Council to perform speed and volume counts on Centennial Avenue and to review implementing traffic calming measures, staff recently deployed traffic radar counters to capture traffic behaviors along this road section. The reported data found that the average daily volume is approximately uh, 5,700 vehicles. Average speed through uh, that area is 56 kilometers in a, an existing posted 50, uh, with the 85th percentile speed being 62 kilometers per hour. Generally, the findings are consistent with the road's function and classification and purpose. Traffic calming is another tool used to modify tra driver behavior. The purpose of traffic calming is to restore a road to its functional classification. In this case, Centennial Road is being utilized by traffic appropriately as a suburban link, being adjacent to an urban center and used as a bypass route. And therefore, traffic calming treatments are recommended. Studies findings have been shared with the OPP so that they can deploy traffic, a targeted enforcement rather. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brian. So, uh, just a few comments that I would like to make. Um, the OPP have clocked dump trucks going from the construction site of the new subdivision going over 80 kilometers an hour down this street, which to me is totally unacceptable when it's a residential street. Also, um, when you mentioned the number, the 5,700 vehicles, the average, that means 845 of them are going over 63. Uh, and that 63 kilometers an hour to me that's unacceptable on a residential street what we were hoping to see there were those signs like we have on carlo road at the moment down the center lines that remind people they're just on the center line that you have put in brian um, that remind people that it's 50 or it's 40 depending on where they are on that road and people do slow down those are working we have had all kinds of people in port tell us how much those are working and that's what we were hoping to see on centennial 
not expensive things, nothing drastic, but we really would like to see them slow down. And I feel very sorry for the people. There is no way anyone can walk across that street at the moment. And it, it really is a very unpleasant street at the moment with the speeding trucks, particularly from the construction going on from the city uh, so, uh, south of Elm. Okay, thank you, Sally. And, Tom? Certainly, Dad, to uh, Mayor Martin. Uh, um, Councillor Bill Fair lives on Centennial Avenue. Wanted me to thank you for, for your efforts. Certainly, there has been the OPP have stepped up. He's told me that there's more more uh, surveillance, so it helps. But it, uh, I agree with Mayor Martin. It, the probably the number one complaint we get in Central Algon is is traffic, traffic speed, um, whether it's justified or not. Again, um, we we are concerned Colder Ave with the construction on the intersection. That it's become a a very busy road as well. I think most of us agree 5,700 cars is a lot of cars on, on any street. Um, so I, I thank you for the effort on behalf of Councillor Fair. It's, it's an ongoing thing and it's many pieces of the puzzle, certainly the squeaky wheel and more, more surveillance, speed traps, et cetera. But uh, um, I agree with some of those um, gravel trucks and, and that's all over where there's construction. They need that constant reminder. I think some of the signs, like um, I see them all the time, like drive like your kids live here. And, and these other things are they're very minor in cost, but uh, we need that constant reminder. Okay, thanks, Tom. Grant? Thank you, Mr. Warren. I think it's, it's uh, I think, I'm not sure if it's the times or people are, more people are at home right now and knows it more. Uh, but I, I notice uh, in the past two weeks, I've gotten calls from Shedden and Fingal, people complaining about the speeds going through Shedden and Fingal. It's a, I think it's just a problem across the board that uh, people don't pay attention to the signage and they're in a hurry to go someplace and they really don't care about the surroundings they're in. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what we do about it. Um, I was going to ask OPP to step up uh, some surveillance at Fingal and Shedden, but obviously I got <laughs> so. Um, I don't know what we do, but I, I think it's a discussion for the police services board, but it seems to be a growing issue and maybe it's just perception, but, um, definitely I've been seeing the call volume go up on people bad about speeding in their rural area in their urban areas. Just one other comment. I did notice, um, on Brian's report report that the, the. Higher speeds were in the area from Lawton to Bodkin because that's the area where there's, you know, you're farthest away from the two stop signs. So by the time you reach the middle of the street, you're going much faster and then you slow down when you have to stop and you, you know, you have to speed up when you're coming in. So that's a lot of the street. That's the, that's two thirds of the street between there and that's where the, the speed was higher. I, I still would like to see those center things. I know they're not expensive. I know they have to be removed in the winter for snow plowing, but they certainly would help in my opinion. Yeah, if I could respond to that. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, the, the, as was noted to council, as it relates specifically to the King George uh, rehabilitation project, the center lane bollards are a temporary traffic calming measure that was that were implemented uh, given the change in and in increasing uh, traffic volumes on Carlow and, and uh, Warren Street specifically, uh, but uh, um, traffic uh, Transportation Association of Canada would tell you uh, that such solution in the absence of enforcement uh, lacks compliance, and so. Um, again, those were measures implemented as part of a capital project that are intended for a temporary uh, short period of time and, and will be removed. And, and accordingly, unfortunately, such solution would <coughs> be recommended for, for Centennial. Duncan? Yeah, I, I think that this is not just a problem in Algon County, it's a problem throughout the whole province. And, and I think that at some point in time, the province is going to have to get their head around the fact that a, a highly trained, uh, highly equipped uh, law enforcement officer, I don't believe is the best use of that individual's time is in writing speeding tickets. 
I, I think that we have to come to a conclusion uh, as a society, which people are we uh, scared of that we need to use those highly trained officers uh, in that function and who are we just annoyed with or uh, maybe a little bit miffed at they're driving too fast so you know at some point in time we need to be able to set up a, a situation where there are uh, well i don't care whether it's a private company or someone that is uh, has has the authority to look after infractions like that and allow our uh, our police officers to do what they're trained to do uh and i i think to uh, Sit on the side of the road uh, because we don't have enough of them to to cover the county, and we've got speeding going on in every area. That there has to be another way, and we have to either have a discussion with the province or the police services board, saying, "Have you thought about another way that we can look after infractions like this and not use our our very expensive officers?" Good. Just a comment. John, you had a question. Cameras? No, no, I don't. So, Just cameras, yeah. Sorry, just one other comment, Brian. When you mentioned that the centerline bollards in Port Stanley are just temporary, we are getting all kinds of requests from the citizens of Port Stanley to make them permanent. So, just so you know. Any other questions for Brian? We're in second of Brian's report. Have the second of Brian's report. Moving seconder. That's Fail. Just, just one more comment. Uh, I believe that as a municipality, we do have the authority now to put speed cameras up. Do we not, Brian? That's correct. Do we know what uh, a cost of those cameras are? I'd be happy to investigate that. I don't have that offhand. I think that would be uh, something that uh, certainly uh, I think brings everybody to attention. That uh, you get a you get a present in the mail if you're not paying attention to the speed signs. Generate some random revenue. Okay, we got to move. Yeah, all right. I, I'll, I'll second it. All in favor. Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councilor Martin. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Jaguar. Yes. Councilor Ketchball. Yes. Mr. Warden. Yes. Thanks. You go. The motion is carried. Thank you, Brian. You're doing the municipal assessment. Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. In support of uh, existing and future plan development within the city of St. Thomas and the county, improvements to the county intersection of Elm Line and Centennial Road is required to achieve an acceptable level of service. Accordingly, a Schedule B municipal class environmental assessment to develop a transportation plan for intersection improvements has been completed by BT Engineering Incorporated. The study had evaluated alternatives to improve the operation, safety, and capacity of the existing intersection, and such alternatives were presented through an online public information center held from May 19th to June 5th in light of the province's COVID-19 state of emergency declaration. Based on public agency and stakeholder comments received from the PIC, the study project file provided before you has identified a 45 meter roundabout as the preferred alternative. Subject to council's endorsement, the study project file will be placed on the public record for the mandatory 30 day public review period following publication of a notice of completion. The preliminary opinion of probable construction costs is estimated to be 1.3, $1,329,600, that's exclusive of HST, engineering, or property acquisition costs, but is inclusive of 20% contingency. Absolutely. The 2019 capital budget included $500,000 necessary to complete the municipal class environmental assessment, prepare the detailed design, and provide the required contract administration during construction. Accordingly, additional budget funds will need to be added to the applicable future capital budget years to fund the balance of all related project costs. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brian. Questions for Brian on this one? Yes, yes. thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. Brian, what exactly is a protected bicycle lane? Three, Mr. Warden, as opposed to having a consolidated or combined bicycle, 
bicycle lane and vehicle lane side by side. It is it is protected by a curb or a raised median. So is this median going to be traversable? Meaning that if you've got larger equipment or things, can they? Will they? Is that median going to be an impediment to traffic, or is it going to be something that uh, is like a rollover curve? Uh, at this point, detailed design hasn't been completed, but it would be designed in such a way that protects the cyclists from maneuvering of vehicles around uh, the roundabout. Certainly, the internal curb radius will be a mountable curb to accommodate larger uh, pieces of equipment, so whether that be fire machinery or large tractor trailers that are that are making the turn. Thank you. The intention is to protect the cyclist. Any other questions for Brian on this one? Duncan? Yes, Mr. Warden, through you now, as I read in the report there, that uh, uh, special interest groups have been consulted on that, uh, uh, where an uh, example was the Federation of Agriculture uh, consulted uh, with a, a direct response. And uh, uh, certainly from uh, your perspective, do you feel that you received um, you know, uh, input from the agricultural community as to the size, location, and usage of this roundabout? Yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied that the study team uh, has uh, garnered uh, positive feedback. A lot of feedback uh, was proactive in, in obtaining that feedback as well, uh, whether it be from the various uh, stakeholder groups as well as each of the affected property owners. We, we met and, and uh, spoke to each of them. Uh, obtain their feedback and and we are we are confident and satisfied with the commentary provided uh just one supplementary can you give uh some of us on council a um roundabout that is of, the, of that size of the 45 meter size that uh, we can uh, virtually go and uh, drive around and see just exactly how it looks I, I'm happy to follow up uh, after this meeting and, and provide an example. I, I can't think of one offhand. Certainly, the city of St. Thomas's uh, roundabout would be a, a much larger diameter, but uh, I can certainly inquire and and uh, and get back to all of council. Okay, I'd I, I, I personally like to see what mm -hmm. uh, what it looks like. So, well, I found that interesting. The one down by the Sandy Mellon Hill, I use that quite often, and I have seen. Um, double trailer transport trucks maneuver that very, very easily. So that I'm interested in that. You said that's much larger because I can envision um, the need for one on Centennial Ave to have the same agriculture equipment go around it. So if it's much smaller, I guess I would, I'm a big fan of roundabouts, but I, I know there is a definite need there for agricultural equipment. Three, Mr. Warden, it's it, it certainly, uh... Put in perspective, uh, the city of St. Thomas has a roundabout on uh, Southdale Line. Uh, the one being proposed is, is certainly much larger than what exists there. Uh, but as mentioned, I will follow up with council and, and identify a location for which uh, all can and get an idea of what uh, what it will be like. Any other questions for Brian? Seeing none, the recommendation before you, mover and second for that recommendation, please. Pardon. Clark, all clear. Warden McHale? Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Martin? Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Jaguar? Yes. Councilor Ketchbach? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. I zero the motion is carried. Thank you. Brian, you're doing the deer crossing? Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. County Council has directed staff to evaluate existing deer crossing warning signage along county roads in cooperation with Elgin OPP. The guidelines for deer crossing warning signage are outlined in the Ontario Traffic Manual Book 6, titled Warning Signs. In order to reevaluate suitable placement of warning signage, a deer collision key map is prepared by the county's GIS uh, technologist, has been prepared, is included in the report. Uh, associated with previous five years worth of collision data history. Uh, such map depicts, ex also depicts uh, existing uh, 54 deer crossing warning signage locations shown in yellow 
and 22 enhanced deer crossing warning signage locations shown in red. A review of the recent five year deer collision experience and existing signage has determined that additional deer warning signage is required at 47 locations as depicted in the second map and adjustments associated with the 22 enhanced deer crossing warning signage locations is also required. Staff have discussed deer collision signage and public communication strategies with Elgin OPP. Collision data provided by Elgin OPP uh, is consistent with the collision data obtained from the county ARIS portal and used by the county. The Ontario Provincial Police is supportive of additional enhanced signage and also noted the importance of public awareness. The OPP normally issues a fall press release with respect to deer collisions and county staff have proposed to post this messaging on the county's website and through social media at the same time in collaboration intended to increase public awareness. Total project cost to complete the additional signage installation is approximately 22,000 and is proposed to be funded by the, the county's road sign replacement project. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brian. Questions for Brian on the deer crossings? Sally? Just appreciation from the police services part. It's great, thank you. Yeah. Just a clarification, because when we discussed this earlier, and it was prompted request from the OPP, but the statistic, they were saying they had a sharp increase in the one quarter. But did we define that? Because I can remember 10 years ago, when I was on the police services board, um, the collisions were approximately one day, pushing over 400. And, and I thought I read somewhere that's really not that much difference. But they, we had a discussion, if I remember, that uh, we were almost thinking that that was a quarter. Has that been clarified? Yeah, through you, Mr. Warden, uh, based on the statistics provided by the OPP, as well as our, our vehicle collision data, uh, the number of collisions appears to be consistent with past years. Uh, we didn't see any significant anomaly that, uh, uh, that caused uh, any alarm. Yeah. So then really not much has changed. Spending 20, uh, like would they put uh, quite often every fall they go out and they put up the flash and ember lights and, you know, these accidents are, you can have the best precautions, but you know, just like that, a deer pops in front of you. I don't know how you, it's going to happen. So I, any attempt for safety I'm in favor of, but this isn't a new problem. I think this same pattern that's, We've had for years. Those are our observations as well. And, and certainly what is changing is, is uh, amending the program uh, with some additional signage and, and moving that, uh, that signage to lo perhaps new locations or, or different locations where deer appear to be crossing during the running season. Any other questions, Duncan? Yes, Mr. Warden, through you, uh, Brian, has any thought ever been given to uh, uh reaching out to the insurance companies to see if there is any interest in uh uh you know sponsoring some of these signs and alleviating that twenty two thousand dollar bill that would be to the county uh, certainly it's in their best interest if uh you know these signs are put in place if it's saving them money maybe they would be willing to contribute towards it three mr orden we we certainly have not had those discussions we're happy to do so if, if uh if council will, uh, uh, will Ed, thank you, Mr. Warden. Brian, is there any concern uh, that by permanent placement of the new proposed signs will lead to uh, complacency because uh, they just get ignored after a bit? Whereas, uh, for example, the flashing lights are put up and taken down every year and put back up. It's a reintroduction of a new element every year. So that's what I'm wondering. Uh, is that thought been brought into the uh, discussion? Three, Mr. Warden, certainly uh, the seasonal installation of the amber lights help emphasize uh, mm -hmm. those, the seasonal uh, running season of deer. Uh, certainly, as, as council could appreciate, the deer certainly doesn't follow, abide by the signage. So um, great. The, we, there certainly will be uh, need in future to continue monitoring this effort and, and, and make adjustments to the signage as required. Thank you. Any other questions for Brian? 
Seeing none, mover and seconder for the recommendation. Martin and Jones, all in favor? Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Martin? Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Jaguar? Yes. Councilor Ketchba? Yes. Councilor Warden? Yes. 9 0. The motion is carried. Thank you. Steve, you're doing the next one? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, the uh, report before you really or is the uh, latest in the line of reports dealing with the transfer of part three and now part uh, nine uh, proceedings from the province to the municipality. Um, by the way, part nine relates to appeals. Um, attached to the report is a draft of the uh, revision, proposed revisions to the uh, transfer agreement, both the MOU and the local side agreement uh, received from the province. The province is looking for um, council's uh, approval uh, for, the, uh, for the current uh, uh, amending agreements. Um, the amending agreements are required before the transfer can actually be made. A couple of developments since the uh, report was prepared. Firstly, although we've learned that although the province is looking for approval of the current drafts, the final version may not be available till later in the fall, is the words that we got, um, which led us, uh, both Mr. Huber and I, to um, consider what we can do to facilitate the transfer because we're concerned that if it, they all come at once, we've had uh, since March 16th, uh, no part three appearances as well as any part three charges. We've negotiated with the current crown and uh, commencing uh, this week, Mr. Huber is being allowed access to all the part three files to uh, review and, uh, and be prepared. So what I'm looking for today, subject to your questions, is the uh, report to be received and filed for approval and subject to my review once the final versions are received authorization for execution. Okay, thank you, Steve. Questions for Steve and his report? Seeing none, mover and seconder for Steve's report, please. Jim Gary, I'll move. McPhail and Jaguar, all in favor? Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Martin? Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Frank? Councilor Jaguar? Yes. Councilor Ketchabaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. 9 0, the motion is carried. Thank you. Now, the next one on the connectivity committee uh, appointments. Uh, staff has recommended we defer this until after we have our closed session because we are discussing this item in closed session. So we'll defer that one till after the closed session. We have a motion to defer. Yes. Motion to defer. Ketchabaugh and, and Marks, all in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Yes. Councilor Martin. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Jaguar. Yes. Councilor Ketchabaugh. Yes. And Mr. Warden. Yes. 9 0, the motion is carried. Thank you. And Julie, you're doing the next one on the Ontario Health Team? I am. And uh, following that, we should break for okay. a media event. Yep. Uh, but through you, Mr. Warden, the purpose of this report is to provide Council with really just an update on the activities of the Elgin Ontario Health Team group. Uh, they've reached another important milestone. And the recommendation before you is to receive and file the report. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Julie. Questions for Julie on her report? So not, a, not that I really like the new format of the reports. I just wanted to say with the strategic plan there and the funding and all that, I really commend you on the new form of the reports. Team effort. Any other questions for Julie? Move her in second for Julie's report, please. Martin and Jones, all in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Martin. Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Chaguer? Yes. Councilor Ketchbaugh? Yes. Mr. Yes. 9 0, the motion is carried. Thank you. Now we're meeting in front of the museum. Is that where we're? The Heritage Center. Okay. And for those members who are on the call and members of the public who are um, 
on the call as well. We hope to be able to resume the meeting uh, sometime around 11.45 or 11.50 a.m. So we look forward to seeing you again then. Okay, so we'll have a brief recess. And Doctor's board say. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> I thought, I wonder how these things, they reflect it all. Where did you find out? Okay, good morning again, everyone. We're back online and uh, we've been jumping around a lot this morning, but we are, we'll go back to Julie's with the COVID-19 emergency team planning. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Three to members of council. This is the fifth monthly report that we are um, submitting to council which provides an overview of uh, the emergency management team's response efforts to the pandemic in Elgin County and across the corporation. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Julie. Questions for Julie? Grant? Just, just more of a comment, just keep up the good work. I know it's uh, been a tough haul for you guys. Keep it up. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we are, we got everything done as far as yep. Oh, motion receive and file. Sorry, <laughs> ahead of myself. Easy to do. Jones, Martin, all in favor? Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councilor Martin. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Jaguar. Yes. Councilor Ketchabaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. 9 zero. the motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, six items of correspondence. Anyone wish to make comments or support? So? Just one, I was glad to see that the Wonderland Road um, notice of study was commencing. Anything else on correspondence? So move and second to receive and file. Fail, Ketchaba. Sure. All in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Martin? Yes. Councilor Mark? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Shiger? Yes. Councilor Ketchaba? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. 9 0, the motion is carried. Okay, uh, other business, state some inquiry by my members. Notice a motion. We have two under uh, matters of urgency. Steve, are you doing the first one on pace cover? I am. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. We just need a motion. Uh, majority of council has to consent to the additional items of urgency, of which there are three. Okay. Council's consideration today. One is a matter of property for closed session. One is housekeeping amendments to the face coverings bylaw, which will be reviewed by the county solicitor. And the additional item is um, the request from Bell for a letter of support for their broadband funding application. Okay, well, as Julie said, we need a motion and a mover and seconder for Julie's suggestion. Marks, all in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Council Purcell? Yes. Council Martin? Yes. Council Marks? Yes. Council Jones? Yes. Council French? Yes. Council Jaguar? Yes. Council Ketchabaugh? Yeah. Mr. Warden? Yes. 9 0, the motion is carried. Okay, now, Steve. Uh, with apologies to uh, Council, I can indicate that uh, when I was reviewing the uh, face covering bylaw as acted just last Thursday in anticipation of a meeting on Friday, I realized that uh, somehow, uh, and probably my fault, that uh, I missed a couple of um, changes to section numbers. Um, and we need to make uh, changes to correct those uh, deficiencies. So when I was adding a couple of um, sections, the internal section references didn't get uh, changed to reflect the uh, the changes. So uh, I will be there, you will be considering a uh, a bylaw 
to amend the face covering and essentially it simply is correcting four section references uh, as well as an error in the bylaw enforcement officer uh, definition. So my apologies, but that's uh, uh, that's the matter of urgency. An error in bylaw enforcement officer? No, just the definition yes. of bylaw enforcement officer. Uh, the reference is um, the, by, the, the section should read that a bylaw enforcement officer would include a bylaw enforcement officer agent appointed or contracted by any lower tier uh, municipality located within the territorial limits of the County of Elgin and to which lower tier municipality this bylaw applies. So uh, there had been some somehow through the various changes, it had picked up a previous uh, version of that uh, of that section. So I'm just correcting that to ensure, but it does provide for the exclusion of some of the uh, lower tier municipalities. Okay, thank you, Steve. Any other questions for Steve? So we need a, a, a question, Mr. Ward. Oh, sorry, Duncan. In, in the context of that bylaw, being that it's uh, it's an upper tier uh, bylaw, are there are provisions in there as move forward and things uh, uh, change uh, that uh, the lower tier municipality that we need to endorse this bylaw at the lower tier? No. Oh. oh, okay. And so there's, uh, if things change, there's no opting out unless there's, uh, uh, as long as it's a county bylaw, it's a county bylaw and the municipality has no uh, ability to opt out or change uh, the uh, integrity of uh, the bylaw to fit their needs as they see them fit? There is a provision under the application of the bylaw that excludes um, lower tier municipalities who have enacted their own bylaw. At this point, the exclusions are for the city of St. Thomas, uh, for the town of Aylmer, and for the municipality of Dun Dunwich. If a lower tier municipality wishes to enact its own bylaw, I think that the, um, with the proper um, notification after the enactment of the uh, lower tier by the additional lower tier uh, bylaw, this bylaw could be amended to just uh, extend that exclusion. You answered the question, even though I didn't ask it. I, I, I hate to think that I, I, I yeah. how you're starting to think. Yeah. <laughs> Scary place. <laughs> Any other questions for Steve? Okay, mover and seconder for Steve's report, please. Jones and McPhail, all in favor? Warren McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councillor Martin? Yes. Councillor Marks? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor French? Yes. Councillor Shiger? Yes. Councillor Ketchabal? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. Dear, the motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, and you're dealing with uh, bell request, Julie? Yes. So this morning, I received a request from Bell uh, for County Council support by way of a letter of support for their application to the Improving Connectivity for Ontario program. So stage one applications for the province's IPOP or Improving Connectivity for Ontario Broadband Funding Program. Um, so applications are due August 21st. And the purpose of stage one is really for the province to confirm project eligibility. And if applicants are deemed eligible, they'll need to complete a more complex stage two application, which is due the end of November. So, um, just to review the letter received from them, as you may be aware, the Government of Ontario has launched the Improving Connectivity for Ontario program, providing up to $150 million over four years to increase the number of households and or businesses that can access advanced connectivity services in areas of need. We're pleased to inform you that, based on our analysis of the opportunities available, your region will be included as part of a Bell application to the ICON program. 
If successful, Bell will be able to deliver internet download speeds of up to 50 megabits per second and uploads of 10 megabits per second per second to many residents and businesses in your region who do not currently have access to this level of service. Importantly, the Government of Ontario is requesting that initial applications to the ICON, ICON program include letters of support from local authorities and or representatives to reinforce that a need exists in the area. ICON applications are due August 21st, and for this reason, they are urgently requesting that we provide a letter um, indicating County Council support by August 18th. Uh, the support should highlight that access to broadband connectivity is an important priority for the region and that local residents and businesses would benefit as a result of Bell's application. Uh, they have attached a template that we could use to customize should we wish to do so and um, have provided follow up information. Should you wish to provide a letter and. Um, Lastly, they say, to be clear, at this stage, they are only seeking preliminary support. They'll work closely with our team as part of the next phase in the application process with more details, including specific local areas within the region that would benefit. And those will be determined as part of that process moving forward in the coming months. Their ICON application for our region is up against proposals for other areas across Ontario, and there will be competition. So any indication of support they've indicated could go a long way in helping them secure the necessary funding to address broadband needs in Elgin County. So they urge us to take advantage of this opportunity and look forward to your support. And um, we will be sure to include a copy of this correspondence with the minutes for today's meeting. And it was received um, shortly after 9 a.m. this morning. Okay, thank you, Julie. Questions for Julie on this? Right. I guess how does this affect SWIFT is my biggest concern and the efforts we've put there. Is this a, is this a good or a bad thing? Is I, I have sneaking suspicion that we support this, we may be undercutting somebody else. If I may, Mr. Gordon, for you, um, we did receive correspondence from Barry Fields, the CEO of SWIFT, um, requesting that if local councils are supporting any ICON applications to which they were in favor of getting broadband through um, these letters of support, certainly the warden sent out a letter to all service providers indicating that county council would be in favor of supporting um, any of their local initiatives to secure other levels of government funding. Um, but Barry had indicated that if we are aware of any applications being submitted in our municipalities and would like any support or review from SWIFT to just um, connect the two entities. So there, are, um, he's very also provide the overall schedule. I believe um, they're not in conflict with, with each other. Okay. So, so, yeah, I just, Grave concern that uh, Bell has taken a very, very, very long time to get to this point. <clears throat> very concerned about that. But your read on this, Julie, is they're they're enhancing the program rather than hurting the program. Okay, then I can support it. Any other questions for Julie or Duncan? Yeah, I I received this letter a long time ago, asking for support for Bell. And uh, it wasn't as detailed as what you've indicated to us today. I don't know if it was the same thing or not, but uh, being the suspicious, selfish individual that I am, I called the dude up and I said, okay, here it is. You want support, but you're not telling me what I'm supporting. So you figure out what's in it for me and uh, maybe we'll talk. And with that conversation, he really couldn't, I was an engineer for Bell out of, I forget where the heck he was, not that far away. And he really couldn't give me uh, any detail of, uh, of just exactly what this enhancement was going to be. And my, my concern was that 
you know, is, is it money that's going to go into the 5G network that they're building along the 401 corridor that's going to help some people but not help a lot of people because uh, a lot of people don't have that 401 corridor uh, running through their municipality. So, uh, again, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those support us and everybody's going to go to heaven, but uh, it doesn't tell you when anybody's going to go. So I'm a little concerned that... Uh, uh, as Julie read it, I think that there's a bit more detail that it is preliminary and, uh, uh, you know, as, as Councillor uh, Jones has said, they haven't really, I don't think, performed to the level that we hoped that they would have performed to at this point in time. So, uh, I, I guess on the initial stage of it, uh, I, I guess uh, I'm okay with it as long as there's more site specific information coming and further support necessary that really shows what we're going to get in Alcan. Um, just as a rec recommendation, given that there are some questions that have uh, come up from members of council and that this is a time sensitive request, uh, the direction could be that CAO be directed to follow up with SWIFT um, with respect to the application and um, request that has been received from them and that following this review that I will undertake um, and subject to the warden's approval, a letter being uh, sent to Bell in support of their ICON application. Okay. Great. Well, you won't get much information out of Bell. It's all secret, 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 secret stuff. And uh, so uh, they're not going to tell you much. Mr. Warden, it's, uh, it's, it's Bob Purcell, if I may. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, yeah, I, I support what Julie just said. The only thing I would add is we have just created this committee on connectivity. I, I would just have the warden and the committee agree with Julie to send a letter of support after she does her investigation. It just then in the future, that's how we would handle these things through that committee. And um, once we have the proper details, we can work from there. Uh, Julie's got something to say. Go ahead, Julie. With your consent, Mr. Warden, through you to Councilor Purcell, while well, that would ordinarily be our um, course of action in uh, a situation like this, the first connectivity meeting does not take place until September the 8th. And the, as the uh, as Bell has indicated, they would require this letter of support from Council, should you wish to consent to it, by August 18th. So. You've been here a long time. They've been there a long time. It's really short notice. It's, uh, and, and that is my concern. They're given us seven days to decide. And it's almost like a knee-jerk reaction that I don't think we should take. And, and I, I do support staff investigating this further, and, and uh, I think uh, you just don't uh, jump to any. Uh, I don't know how does. Yeah, I think we need to uh, investigate this a little further. Tom, I also share some hesitation. I can say that I'm probably considered a loyal Bell customer. To about four hundred and fifty dollars a month with three cell phones, a TV package, and home phone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I welcome the day I get an option. Any other questions or comments, Mr. Warden? It's Dominique. Go ahead. So I, I understand that the timing is is not great, but if um, at least the members of the connectivity committee could be included in the correspondence or part of the exchange with the warden. Because um, I certainly would like to be able to read uh, what we've just received and uh, review it and provide additional questions or comments. We can do that. Any other questions or comments? So, have you got a, a motion there, Julie? Um, yeah. Here you, Mr. Warden, to members of council that the CAO be directed to follow up with SWIFT and the Bell representative and seek additional information uh, or supplementary information with respect to the request received 
and dated August the 11th, 2020. And that um, subject to um, the information gathered and the review completed by the CAO, the warden, and a representative from the Connectivity Committee, that the warden be directed to uh, submit a letter of support if appropriate. Okay, everybody happy with that? Oh, Julie? Hey, just as follow up, I think it is important to establish which member of the Connectivity Committee will be. Um, providing assistance to the warden. We could provide it to both council members of the committee. There's just two, right? From council? Yeah, so uh, Tom and, and, and uh, Dominique are on, on the committee so we can support uh, or give, give them both the information. Okay. So everybody happy now? Mover and second for Julie's uh, suggestion. Move by Purcell. Move by Purcell, second by Jaguar. All in favor? Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Councillor Purcell. Yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. Councillor Marks. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor French. Yes. Councillor Shaguer. Yes. Councillor Ketchabon. Yes. Mr. Warden. Yes. Nine zero. The motion is carried. Now we're about to move into closed session for the following reasons. Uh, there is seven items. Uh, first, the Director of Engineering Services, Municipal Act 239-2, e-litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local boards, the Fillmore Bridge. Two is County Solicitor, Municipal Act 239-2, e-litigation or potential litigation, including members before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local boards, Energy Board proceeding update number two. Supervisor, Legislative Service and Community Relations, Municipal Act 239-2B, personnel matter about an identified individual, including municipal or local board employees, connectivity committee appointments. Four, Chief Administrative Officer, Municipal Act Section 239-2K, a position plan procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on our behalf of the municipality our local board's long-term care transition coordinator. Five, Chief Administrative Officer, Municipal Act, Section 239-2K, a position plan procedure criteria or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on on behalf of the municipality or local board, MEDAV, EMS, Elgin, Ontario, MEMSEO, contract renewal, Six, Warren David Mantle, Municipal Act 239 2, 2 personnel matter, but an identifying individual, including a municipal, local board employee, labor relations or employee negotiation, chief administrative officer, annual performance evaluation. And number seven, 239 2A, security of the property of the municipality or local board. So, move, move, move in seconder to move in the committee of the whole. Sorry, closed meeting. Grant, seconder, catch a ball, all in favor. Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Council Purcell. Yes. Council Martin. Yes. Council Marks. Yes. Council Jones. Yes. Council French. Yes. Council Jaguar. Yes. Council Ketchbaugh. Yes. Mr. Warden. Yes. Nine zero. The motion is carried. Thank you. You let me know when you're ready. You ready? Okay. The motion to uh, rise and report. Jones, uh, catch a ball. All in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Councillor Purcell. Yes. Councillor Martin is absent. Councillor Marks. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor French. Yes. Councillor Jaguar. Yes. Councillor Ketchaba. Yes. And Mr. Warden. Yes. Eight zero. The motion is carried. Thank you. So we'll deal with a closed meeting, uh, number one. For closed session item number one, which yes. is the CAO's performance appraisal. Uh, open the doors, we're still in closed session. There's no public in the building, so I think we're okay. But uh, for closed session item number one, CAO's performance appraisal that the county solicitor proceed as directed. Mover and seconder, catch ball. Marks, all in favor? 
Deputy Warren McPhail? Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Shiger? Yes. Councilor Ketchabaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. Here the motion is carried. Thank you. Close meeting item number two, which is Fillmore Bridge. Fillmore Bridge. That a report from the county solicitor and county engineer be received. Okay. Over in Secretary McPhail. Jones, all in favor? Deputy Morton McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Shiger. Yes. Councilor Ketchabon. Yes. And Mr. Warden. Yes. Zero. The motion is carried. Thank you. Close meeting item number three, which was the energy board proceedings. Uh, be it resolved that the report from the county solicitor be received and staff proceed as directed. Okay, mover and seconder. Purcell. Who else was there? Purcell. And Purcell, all in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Council Purcell. Yes. Council Marks. Yes. Council Jones. Yes. Council French. Yes. Council Shiger. Yes. Council Ketchabaugh. Yes. Mr. Warden. Yes. Eight zero. The motion is carried. We're in camera item number four. That uh, the report from the supervisor of legislative services be received, and that staff proceed as directed. Mover and seconder. Jones. Jagger, I'll second. And Jagger, all in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail? Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Jagger? Yes. Councilor Ketchabaugh? Yes. Mr. Warren? Yes. Zero. The motion is carried. Closed meeting item number five, long-term care transition coordinator. Uh, resolved that staff proceed as directed by council regarding a one-year uh, Agreement with Gail Kaufman Carlin Consulting in the role as long term care transition coordinator. Mover and seconder. Marks. Jones. Here. All in favor. Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Council yes. Councillor Marks. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor French. Yes. Councillor Jaguar. Yes. Councillor Ketchabaugh. Yes. Mr. Warren. Yes. Zero. The motion is carried. For in camera item number six, Meta EMS Elgin, Ontario contract renewal. Uh, result that the report from the CAO be received and filed, and that staff proceed as directed. Mover and seconder. McPhail. I'll move it. French. I'll second it. <laughs> All in favor? Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Council Purcell. Yes. Council Marks. Yes. Council Jones. Yes. Council French. Yes. Councilor Jaguar? Yes. Councilor Ketchbaugh? Yes. Mr. Warren? Yes. Zero. The motion is carried. Steve's. Consideration of uh, 6.15 at this time. We have. of Legislative Services. Do we have? We have one from Steve on the easement, do we? Close meeting item number seven that staff proceed is directed. Yes. My apologies. Okay. Mover and seconder for that one. Jones. Marks. <laughs> All in favor. Board McPhail? Yes. Councilor Purcell? Yes. Councilor Marks? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Shiger? Yes. Councilor Ketchbaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. The motion is carried. Okay, now we know we need to go back to the connectivity? Yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Warden, through you to County Council. Uh, the report is before you regarding appointments to the Connectivity Committee. Staff recommend that there be no changes to the terms of reference and that three individuals, uh, Mr. Sean Southern, Mr. Justin Hennings, and Mr. Mike Andrews, be appointed to the Connectivity Committee. Okay. Mover and seconder. Ketchabaugh and McPhail, all in favor. Deputy Warden McPhail? Yes. Councillor Purcell? Yes. Councillor Marks? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor French? Councillor Shiger? Yes. Councillor Ketchabaugh? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. Zero. The motion is carried. Okay, now we need a motion to adopt the recommendations committee of the whole. 
And seconder. Catch Jaguar. Jaguar. And Jaguar. Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Jaguar. Yes. Councilor Ketchbaugh. Yes. Mr. Warden. Yes. Eight zero. The motion is carried. Thank you. Bylaws. Get a first, second, and third read of bylaw 20 40. Being a bylaw to amend bylaw 20 08, provide for the adoption of the 2020 budget of the Corporation of the County of Elgin and to establish the 2020 tax rates goals and to establish the 2020 tax rates for the county constituent municipalities. Mover and seconder. Jones. Marks, all in favor? Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Jaguar. Yes. Councilor Ketchabon. Yes. Mr. Warden. Yes. Eight zero. The motion is carried. The first, second, and third read of bylaw 20 41 being a bylaw to authorize a donation agreement between the Elgin County Pioneer Museum and Don Donald James Ian Begg and Margaret Goodhue, executors of the estate of Donna Vera Evans Bushel. Lord and Secretary Jones French and French, all in favor? Deputy Warden McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Shaguer. Yes. Councilor Ketchabaugh. Yes. Mr. Warden. Yes. Zero. The motion is carried. We had a first, second, and third read of bylaw 20 42, being a bylaw to temporarily require the use of face coverings. And sorry, I'd like to start again. Um, be it a first, second, and third read of bylaw 20 42, being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 20 38, um, being a bylaw to temporarily require the use of face coverings and related health protection measures within enclosed public spaces during the COVID 19 pandemic. Move and second, Do it, Jones. I think tennis elbow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that. And McPhail, all in favor. Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Jaguar. Yes. Councilor Ketchabon. Yes. Mr. Warren. Yes. Zero. The motion is carried. A beta first, second, and third read of bylaw 20 43, being a bylaw to confirm proceedings of the Municipal Council of the Corporation of the County of Elgin at the August 11th, 2020 meeting. Over in seconder. Mark French. All in favor. Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Councilor Purcell. Yes. Councilor Marks. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor French. Yes. Councilor Jaguar. Yes. Councilor Ketchbaugh. Yes. Mr. Warren. Yes. So the motion is carried. That's it for bylaws? Yes. Okay, adjournment after a long meeting. So move. Parks and place fail. All in favor? Deputy Warren McPhail. Yes. Yes. Councilor Marks? Man, yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor French? Yes. Councilor Jaguar? Yes. Councilor Warren? Yes. Zero, the motion is carried. Thank you all for a long meeting, but necessary legislation. Thank you.